Eye Institute. I'm one of the Cornea faculty members here. Uh, welcome to our KPRO study meeting. Uh, we have a, a full schedule for you today. We're going to try and um, stay on time. Uh, very interesting uh, talks. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. I'm going to give it to um, Jose for him to give you some information. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, thank you all of you for uh, not just showing up, but also participating in the Capers Study Group and also in the meetings that we're putting together, just like we have today. Um, special thank you to Dr. Akpek and the Wilmer Institute for hosting the Capers Study Group meeting. Um, as you notice, it we're sort of close or at the same time that Arvo is, uh, is happening. So, with that in mind, we have to have we like to have a somewhat of a mixture of basic science as well as clinical research that uh, we'll share with you today. With our colleagues are presenting um, a couple of. Uh, Housekeeping uh, components, we're going to try to stay on time. We have great moderators that are going to help us in that regards. But to the uh, speakers, to, to please, we'll try to we'll, we'll give you an idea of what your time is so you have an idea of what, uh, what time you have left uh, before uh, you run out of time. And then we'll have some discussion at the end of each section. So all questions of each section will be left for the uh, final component of each uh, uh, section. So as you see here, we have two sessions, the materials, biocompatibility, by integration, and bench to bedside, which approaches more of the basic science component. And then we'll have the second session with uh, free papers, and then the third session will be more of a clinical research component, which we named the good, the bad, and the ugly and current KPROs. Um, uh, also, uh, special thanks to uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Jimmy Perel, for uh, being sort of the, the, the spearheading person uh, in the KPRO study group, and uh, we look forward to continuing the work together. Uh, with that in mind, I would like to ask the, our, our moderators, Dr. Gerling, please, uh, in, the, in the moderator, I'll, I'll sit in for Dr. Perez while he shows up. And I'll pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Perel, which will start the session, uh, Materials, Biocompatibility, Biointegration, Bench to Bedside, and Dr. Perel's talk, uh, History Does Not Need to Repeat Itself, What Have We Learned So Far? Jim Marie. Thank you. So the presentation is in fact uh, in the honor of many people that have helped me finding out what was the keratoprosthesis and that quite a long time. I don't know. Are we looking at the same thing? You're going to connect your right? You're going to no, connect to yours? This here? thing is supposed to go forward. Is it the same one? You go insert? Forward? Okay. So I was given this title, History Does Not Need to Repeat Itself, What We Have Learned So Far. So I had to go back to what I had learned and when I had learned it, thanks to Emmanuel Lacombe, who introduced me to K-Pro in the late 80s, Eddie Alfonso, who is now a new chairman, who was actually a pupil, a student of uh, Professor Dorman, Joseph Stoiber, who came as a fellow in my laboratory and now is in uh, Austria, and Bernard Duchesne, who was also one of my fellow, who is now in Liège. But the title, in fact, is OKP, OKP, Choice, Two Posterior Fixation Keratoprosthesis and Beyond. Why so is because Emmanuel, who was my teacher, learned with Trampelli, OKP, went to Spain and learned OKP, and then also uh, learned from choice. And gave me the opportunity to see all of his patients, late 80s at the Hotel Dieu Hospital, with Eve Pulican. Uh, I was a visiting prof, associate prof, and so was Professor Dolman, long time ago, a friend of Eve Pulican. So thanks to uh, Emmanuel Lacombe and some of the support, from the Europe, we were able to look at things that went good and things that went bad. 
So here is the keratoprosthesis from Emmanuel Lacan, which called retrocorneal fixation, because contrary to the sorry about that, contrary to the contrary to the uh, Boston Cape rock, the rear part, which has a thread, is actually sutured onto the cornea, and because of what. Emmanuel learned from Strampelli himself. He used buccal mucosa to seal the uh, corneal wound. And if you look at the data of the patient 13 years, which is a pretty good result. But Emmanuel was really upset because of 10 patients or 10 extrusions that occurred really quickly and to prevent from happening. At the polytetrafluoral uh, eater, which is expanded Teflon, together with uh, the Pulican team at the Hotel Dieu. And we had done some experiment in rabbits, demonstra demonstrated something called biointegration, meaning the pores of this polymer were filled with cells. And we published a paper in 1994, and then Leger and uh, Pulican went onwards and publish results two years on 24 patients. So Emmanuel took this, was part of the team, and decided to put some Teflon uh, EPTFE around the optic, thinking the reason for the retraction of the cornea, which was the patient's cornea, not a donor's cornea, was the cause of the problem. So he thought if cells could invade the uh, Teflon and attach to it, then there would be no more retraction. Problem, he operated 10 cases and only had one case left at 10 years. Everything else had extruded. So then he changed his mind and put it underneath the optic, which you can see, sorry, you can see here. Operated 17 cases only had two cases which had retained a prosthesis at eight years. And then finally he actually put it underneath, meaning between the posterior optic and the anterior optic. And he had 10 cases at six years, but he operated 40 cases. Uh, so we did some histology. We did some histology of the cases that were rejected. What we found is we had colonization at first. We had apoptosis, giant shell formation, corneal melt, and extrusion. And I thought, gosh, this everything we did in the rabbit worked fine. So what was the difference? Well, in the rabbit, we actually re-implanted and found that we indeed have colonized in the early period, but then with time, we had giant cells coming in and we had a subchronic inflammation according to uh, specialists. So, in summary, 50% of the PCL pure PMMA retained the prosthesis at 13 years, which is, I think, a pretty good result. Adding the biocolonizable skirt did not improve outcome. The PMMA and the um, EPTFE were too rigid, and the pore of the material was too small compared to a cell. So you got micro, micro mechanical trauma by simply moving your eye or touching it, which means giant cell, the cell die giant cell melting and extrusion. And the same thing occurred with the Pintucci prosthesis and the alpha core, as you all know. And exclusion, same stuff. Aqueous leak, endophthalmitis, and you need a constant uh, supervision. So we went back to the drawing bar. How much time do we have? And we came up with a new uh, concept that is never ending in the anterior chamber. 
for some of the patient this would be possible. So the supra desmetic synthetic cornea was born in 1997. And we made, we called it Keralia. You know, being European, you love to have Latin coming in. And we made a bunch of them, two different types of polymer, EMA and EMA and EMA and VPI, tested them. These are on to Desmet, and we want to prove this, which you see here, scanning it from microscopy. We did a series of rabbits, it's all published, including rabbits that actually had a burnt cornea, neovascularization, the worst type of things. And we got excellent results, and we got to the um, cat as well, also published. Then we went into the patient. So this patient was the first case. One eye was gone, retinal detached. The other one, retina attached, was operated in 2004. The patient was so happy being able to have ambulatory vision that he didn't tell his surgeon, but two weeks later took a flight to Karachi without his medication or ophthalmologist and so on and got into trouble. And then Emmanuel operated three cases. Lyle failed, that had failed a keratoprosthesis implantation. Then multiple failed capro, neovascularized cornea, and all of these failed. Till one Italian professor actually operated a patient that had no cornea surgery, primary implantation. This was done in 2005. Patient had glaucoma, took her daily uh, medication four times a day. And the next thing we know, this was in 2010, the appearance of her synthetic cornea. All the medication that were in these uh, glaucoma drops, some of it ended up in the polymer, which was an hydrophilic uh, acrylic polymer. So I'm wondering now what will happen to Aleo and the Keraclea. So a weaver, there's the opacity there? It's not an opacity. It's basically the cornea. I don't know why we have this cross. <clears throat> the cornea is no longer transparent. It's opalescent, if you wish. And it was various degree. Actually, Victor Perez was the last one of her group having gone to Italy and seen the patient. The patient had retained a prosthesis, but it was no longer transparent. So I wish that the other guys who had a lot more years in front of them to, to take care of that got a better polymer and that we will have uh, success in this um, prosthesis. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Again, we'll leave the uh, questions for, for the session to the end. We have our colleagues from uh, Gour, Dr. Balagis, and to talk about the Back to the Future EPTFE for refugial cornea and why is it suitable for Capro? Thanks everybody for uh, listening to me, inviting me. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Balaji. I'm from Gore. Um, I'm going to talk about why EPTFE may be suitable for Capro, a title uh, thanks to Dr. Perel. Um, <clears throat> we are a company who invented E in front of the PTFE. That's what makes PTFE porous. And that's what uh, 
makes the, the PTFE in these cases work. So we're going to talk about it. Now the team, we're working with Dr. Akpek at Wilmer, and my colleagues Anurag, Thomas, and Dave, they're at the back of the hall here. So flu polymer as a biomaterial is highly bioinert, and we have seen, we have a long history with this material <laughs> and implantable devices. It elicits very little um, immune response, and it's transparent to the body. It doesn't react to the material, and it's permanent. Unlike nylon and other materials, it's permanent. It doesn't change its properties in the body. So we have decades of history uh, with this material as implantable devices, and you see some more for <clears throat> materials, implantable devices on the right-hand side, uh, whether it is uh, a, a graft for the cardiovascular, or a hernia patch, uh, this material is well behaved and we have a long history with this material. And the nice thing about it is uh, we can change the pore structure. We can engineer the right pore structure that's needed for each one of these applications. Just as an example for the hernia patch, uh, when you put it on one side, we want good tissue integration. On the other side, we do not want that. So we can tailor the porosity on both sides, to both surfaces in such a way, one side attaches really well uh, with the tissue and the other side it doesn't. The last one that you see at the bottom, uh, that's a peripheral arterial graft. And uh, typically retinosis is a common issue there. So we have changed the, the surface chemistry. We have put a permanent heparin uh, surface there coating so that we don't have any more restenosis that allows for uh, putting this device in the peripheral part of the body. So that is another chemistry uh, change that we can make on the surface of the PTFE to make for that particular application. Here you have a bunch of different uh, porosities, a variety of porosities and pore structures. So these are some of the changes that we can make with our material. That's what our company is all about as a material science company change the porosity targeting the application. <coughs> so in the case of uh, cross-section, here is a PTFE. You can see how the thickness of the, uh, the membrane, which is probably about 100 pounds thick, and you can see how we can have pore structures for the entire depth of the membrane. Additionally, you can also see the surface part of the uh, membrane, you have these nodes that can create the micro irritation to elicit the tissue to react and, and integrate deep into the pore structure. And when you look at this membrane from the surface shot, you can see how the pore structures look like and how the nodes look like too uh, that's engineered for this application. So the bottom line is we have a broad uh, latitude to change the, the thickness of this membrane from anywhere to the size of millimeter thick to micron or even submicron thick, a few hundred nanometers thick. We have the ability to do that. Now we can change the microstructure, change the surface morphology. PTFE uh, by its very nature is hydrophobic, but if you want it to be hydrophilic so that you can have the, the, the thing to wet out, so we can change the nature of the PTFE with surface modifications. So these are all some of the uh, techniques that we have developed over the many decades that we've been doing, uh, dealing with this material. <clears throat> Another fluor polymer that we have access to is uh, fluoroelastomer. And in this case, it's a very soft, uh, foldable fluoroelastomer that is actually a molded uh, piece of the elastomer uh, in our K-Pro design that I'll show later on. You can see how it is soft, it's foldable, it bounces back to its original shape. It has a refractive index of about 1.33. Uh, pretty good light transmission. It resists fouling because of being a fluoropolymer. It's bioinert. And most importantly, it's also suturable. On the right-hand side, you can see a histopath slide uh, in a rabbit after about three months. 
and uh, you see the uh, suture track uh, going through this uh, uh, capro, and they can see how the collagen has gone right through the suture hole uh, from the anterior lamella to the posterior lamella through the clear part, which is this material. And you can see the two membranes at the top and in the bottom. So addressing some of the unmet needs that we heard from talking to many of you here for a capro, we felt that a biointegration to a corneal tissue has been pretty challenging and something that we want to see if we can make it happen with our material. We want to make a flexible yet durable optic, something that's suturable. Minimally invasive design, not too much into the anterior chamber. Be able to measure IOP with a soft material. If it's compliable, then you can see the pressure somehow. See if it's easily implantable in a single step. And it's fully synthetic. So these are the tall uh, targets that were given to us that we're working towards. So the Gore K Pro, the material set, it consists of a core and skirt design with uh, the central optic be with the soft polymer, the fluoropolymer, and with the skirt that is made of the EPTFE that is specifically made for this application that we've developed. So the clinical targets we're aiming towards is no endophthalmitis, no extrusion, and an optic that resists fouling. Some of the key design elements of this K-Pro is, like I said, it's a soft optic. It's flush profile, both on the anterior surface and the posterior surface. We have the EPTFE on the skirt for full biointegration and a permanent suture that I think we have developed, which we think we have already. The animal model that we're looking at is the New Zealand white rabbits. So we've already implanted these devices. As you can see, the date was implanted and after three months, it looks pretty good. And uh, on the right-hand side, what you see is the hydrophilic nature of the skirt material, which is the PTFE. So it's partially wetted. So if you give it some more time, it's out of a video. After some time, the whole surface becomes wetted and clear. So this is a blown up uh, histopath slide from uh, three months of animal trials with the rabbits. And you can see uh, it's quite unremarkable uh, in the sense that uh, it's very quiet. I uh, see the collagen that has gone the entire thickness, 100 micron thickness of the EPTFE membrane. And you can also see some of those arrows pointing to the nodes, the white nodes on the surface that creates the micro irritation that helps the tissue to grow into the pore structure. There's some keratocytes. So like I said, this is after three months, and we know that we've seen some good results after three months. What happens after six months? What ha happens after one year? So that's what we're trying to address with the next set of studies going a little longer. And finally, given that the material is a soft material, as you change the pressure, this is actually an external result from what happens to the optic. It changes uh, just about one diopter between the 10 and 25 millimeters of mercury. So this alone gives us the optimism that uh, we can get a nomogram for measuring what is the IOP with this material. So as next steps, we are planning a six-month rabbit study at Johns Hopkins with Dr. Ackman. And our biggest uncertainty is the stability of this biointegration over the six months as a next step. And finally, we as a company, uh, we were founded in 1958. Uh, we have more than 10,000 associates worldwide with little over $3 billion in sales, and we are privately held. And this is our first foray into 
an ophthalmic uh, device. We are a cardiovascular company for the most part, and our hope is that this would lead us into other applications in the ophthalmic space. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on to the next presentation. Jennifer? And it's uh, Jennifer Seff. It's uh, from Wilmore Eye Institute. She's going to present uh, titled uh, Implant, Misoplant, Explant Within the Context of Artificial Cornea. Thank you. Thank you. So I changed my title a little bit. Um, hopefully that's okay. Um, my laboratory here on the fifth floor works on uh, biological cornea replacements. So I come from the field of um, regenerative medicine where we're trying to build materials to help redirect um, the regeneration process. And um, there's a great history of synthetic materials um, in medicine, multiple applications. Um, I actually started in the area of orthopedics before moving into the eye. Um, but particularly in the case of regenerative medicine, we're interested in materials that can help direct um, cell behavior. So these can be materials ranging from um, solid type materials, sponges, nanofibers, or hydrogels. And uh, we're very interested in how cells can interact with these materials and how we can design their properties to optimize, um, optimize tissue, um, tissue repair processes. So for, um, today I'll just talk to you about two projects that we have in the area of the cornea, um, going from the top down to the bottom up. So from the top down, looking at how we can take cornea tissue and process it into implants um, that are really off the shelf um, and um, purely biological derived from tissues. And the second, looking from the bottom up, how can we take the base components of um, the cornea, which is collagen, and rebuild the structures that really look identical to the native cornea, but are um, purely made in the laboratory from proteins. So we use a strategy called vitrification, um, which was taught to us by Japanese colleagues who like, likened it to taking a hard-boiled egg and putting it in the refrigerator for a month. Um, and while I didn't have experience with this, they assured me that it actually the white part turns clear. So it's a way to uh, essentially control the water evaporation process and essentially the assembly of proteins then. Um, and um, by choosing a certain humidity and temperature, you can control that vitrification process. And what that allows you to do is control some of the structures. So um, using vitrification with collagen, we can control the fiber structure so that we can get a material that's strong, yet is still clear, derived from collagen, which is not easy. Also, there's a structure function correlation with biology. So as we put keratocytes on different um, vitrified collagen materials, they change their uh, phenotype. So on the left here, I have um, an early vitrified material where you just have some collagen assembly. So the, the grayish part there is where the collagen has not yet assembled. It's still a plain collagen gel. And towards the right, you see the um, highly structured and ordered collagen, which has essentially been fully vitrified. And on those structured materials, not not only do you have increased mechanical strength, but you get a keratocyte phenotype that is more differentiated. So you're going to reduce your chance for um, sort of scar formation. The collagen source makes a difference for anyone who has manufactured clinically collagen products. It can be a challenge. So depending on if you um, use human bovine or um, um, human or bovine um, collagen or even recombinant collagen from a tobacco plant, it can give you different collagen fiber organization, which can then implant, uh, again, impact um, physical properties. Um, translation to the eye. So um, this is just showing an implant in um, the cornea. Um, and this is really just to point out that these were very thin membranes. We could not get it up to a very thick um, sort of human cornea relevant thickness. Um, so we had to come up with a, a new strategy that would allow us to go from 50 microns to 500 microns, but still um, give us the um, clarity and um, uh, mechanical properties that we, um, of course, need for our cornea replacement. So we went and looked at normal cornea development to see how we get that organization process. And essentially, during cor normal cornea development, you have um, small proteoglycans that help direct the assembly of collagen. Um, and so what we did is we found some artificial chaperones that could mimic 
those proteoglycans to help in the assembly process. This is a picture of those, the cyclodextrins, that we could then combine with um, the collagen. And um, this essentially gives us a multi-layered structure. So um, I'll let you pick which one is the native cornea and which is our artificial implant. Right? It's not so easy to see. So we're actually able to get not only the um, collagen fibrils forming, but um, we get them aligned in parallel in um, a particular direction, and then they stack in the lamellae um, that's typical of the, the native cornea. And essentially that allows us to have the physical properties for direct suturing um, in addition to the transparency um, that's obviously required. Um, so you can tell? <laughs> the one on the right is our um, synthetic, or I, I don't want to call it synthetic because it's not um, synthetically derived. It's a, a collagen derived in, in the laboratory. So no living cells were used to make this um, and um, uh, no other chemical components besides the artificial chaperone and the collagen, um, collagen uh, fibers. Um, so we are working on a number of um, 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 continuing with animal studies in collaboration with a company called Igenix. Um, and what we had to do, of course, was move from the flat um, vitrified um, corneas to have a mold that would allow us to vitrify and build those collagen materials, but with the appropriate shape. Um, of the implants. Um, and so now we're um, doing thicker implants um, with um, um, not quite a full keratectomy, but um, we're just starting to go to full thickness implants now um, and, and working on that surgical procedure to be able to do that. Um, and also increasing epithelialization across these um, implants by playing around with the mechanical properties. Um, then I'm going to spend a few minutes on going from the, the top down because um, there are also some interesting results with that. Um, so we had done some work before with uh, characterizing the um, TBI gamma rated cornea, um, in particular looking at what happens to the matrix structure with gamma radiation and um, if all the cellular components are removed. So while you do um, uh, obviously kill all the cells in the gamma-rated cornea, there are still cell remnants left in those materials. Um, and you can see some changes in the matrix organization. So this is an example of a differential scan scanning calorimeter, which essentially um, looks at how much heat is required to denature that collagen. And that's going to depend on how well it's organized. So if it's changed, um, it's going to shift. So the top being the, the fresh cornea and the bottom being the gamma rated. Not a large shift, but it does change a little bit, which is very typical of what gamma radiation does to um, tissue structures during sterile um, in addition to the gamma rated cornea, we've also been looking at how we can take animal corneas and process them into implants that are somewhat similar to that human cornea. The challenge in this is you see on the left, when you do a gentle desalurization procedure, you get significant inflammation when it's implanted in vivo. On the other hand, if you do a harsh uh, desolarization such that it's biocompatible and you don't get the inflammation, you see what happens, you get a very opaque implant. So what we did is we applied that same desolarization procedure um, that again controls water evaporation um, to, to get uh, a clarification of, um, of the desolarized cornea. So on the right there is what happens when you desolarize and get your opaque cornea. And then if you um, um, vitrify it, you can improve that organization. And here's how it happens. Um, so this is your native cornea um, ultrastructure and the collagen organization. When you process it and remove the cells and essentially clean it out, um, you loosen up all that matrix. You can see how the fibers are pulled apart. Um, and what vitrification does is it allows you to sort of put it back together and reassemble it. Um, so then you get your clarity and also enhance your mechanical properties. Taking this a step further, just like in the um, sort of artificially made collagen implant, um, you can make a mold that is specific for even a patient. So these are essentially taking OCT images and, and using the 3D printing, um, which is very popular these days. You use the 3D printing to have a patient-specific mold, which then you can use to um, as a vitrification chamber um, to get the proper shape and um, um, implant properties. So um, this. Uh, this shows our implants. Um, these are actually cross-linked with riboflavin. That's why they're yellow. Um, they're just like that for a, f um, a short time after implantation. But you can see how they're shaped um, after they've been made. 
and we've put them in um, a pocket in a rabbit cornea. Um, and you can see the integration um, and the maintenance of, of that implant. Um, and then we've also placed it in um, uh, partial um, keratectomy defects. Um, and these obviously re the rate epithelial is a little bit better than the um, synthetic materials. Um, that's um, just the conclusion on the cornea part. I just want to mention quickly that we're looking at um, methods to um, essentially artificially create um, um, elements of the conjunctiva and the tear film um, to sort of rebuild the tear film, the ocular surface, um, and um, that was just published. And then we're also looking at methods to decrease inflammation using tissue exocellular matrices and really characterizing the inflammatory process in the cornea um, compared to other parts of the body where we're working on implants. So I'd be happy. I guess we're not taking questions now. Okay, great. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So, do we have, is Darlene here yet? No. We'll do is we'll move on with uh, Dr. Jim Chodosh. Jim? Our next talk was, Dr. Miller is not here yet, so we'll move on with Dr. Chodosh. Jim Chodosh, from our good friend from Mass Pioneer, is going to give us a talk on design evolution at the Boston Cape Town Plant Institute. Looks like it's uh, okay. it should show up here too, right? Yeah. All right. Sorry, folks. I'm a poor substitute for Darlene Miller. Um, can everybody hear me in the back? So it's pretty quiet. Uh, some of the speakers were. I was asked to talk about design. Type 2, and I'll try to stick to that. So I should say that I'm a salaried employee of the Mass Ironer, which distributes Boston prosthesis but receive no profits from the device. So I think most people in this room are familiar with character prosthesis <coughs> and uh, understand the indications, but I wanted to review them briefly. Basically, we use this device in corneal blindness in the setting of a failed corneal allograft. Patients that have a densely vascularized cornea, for example, post-infectious, patients with severe aneuritic keratopathy in, in whom corneal transplantation typically fails, and patients with chemical or thermal injuries or other forms of limbal stem cell dysfunction, uh, assuming that the eyelid function and the tears are intact and that there's no symblephron or other ocular surface characterization. So as a general rule of thumb, we think about this device when a patient has a corneal allograft or, and it's failed, or we think it's going to fail, and there's sufficient visual potential to justify corneal surgery. In contrast, the uh, Boston Type 2, which is in your upper right, is used much less commonly. And we use this in corneal blindness, again, in the setting of severe dryness, patients with ocular surface keratinization, patients with fornix, loss of the fornices or some bluff rub, all of which would, which would prevent normal contact lens wear, retention, and wetting. And disorders in which a Boston type 1 is typically contraindicated. So in my practice, I don't use a type 1 in ocular pemphigoid. I would always go to a type 2. In patients with the most severe corneal uh, chemical injuries, those patients who have, again, loss of normal eyelid function due to cicatrix, or patients who have severe dryness, or who become keratinized. So as a general rule of thumb, the type 2 device can be implanted when a patient has corneal blindness, you believe a corneal allograft would fail, you believe a type 1 keratoprosthesis would fail or already has failed, and when the visual potential justifies intervention. And I would certainly always emphasize 
the patient needs visual potential to uh, benefit from these devices. But there are limitations of the type 1 device. Um, I, I wasn't asked to talk about those, so I'm going to leave most of those aside, but talk about one thing in particular which has led us to a design change, and that is that the cost of the device limits access. Blindness begets poverty, poverty begets blindness, and the majority of the world's corneal blind are poor. The device is also a success when used in the right patient, in the right socioeconomic strata. In the wrong patient, the visual outcome for the patient can be worse than the preoperative vision. So if the patient doesn't get their antibiotics, they can end up with enophthalmitis and go from count fingers or hand motion pre-op to 20-20 post-op back to no light perception after their enophthalmitis. And culture and education levels influence our results. When understanding is limited, whether it be the patient or the surgeon or both, outcomes are also limited. And when we cannot address these issues, though, without first coming to a low-cost device that we can use in these environments. There are solutions for culture and education that, that are, represent social interventions for individual patients who need care to prosthesis, but we can't apply those interventions unless we have a device we can afford to use. I would uh, diverse for a moment and bring your attention to this very interesting article that was in JAMA. And here the authors proposed that if we had a pill that contained aspirin, a mild diuretic, and a statin, that we could prevent and delay millions of deaths, and that this pill theoretically could be made for about $2. However, as the authors point out, no pharmaceutical company will make this pill because no one would make money on it, and all these drugs are already off patent. But in the nonprofit environment, we could theoretically make a $2 pill if we so choose because we don't have the same commitment to shareholders. So we developed the Lucia modification of the Boston Carrier Prosthesis in this, with this intent. And this is the back plate. The uh, innovation here is to make a back plate that we can make off the lathe, which we can make much less expensively. And this is the device assembled without a cornea, and as you see here, and this particular model has been anodized to give it some brown color. And this is less expensive to manufacture. If you ask me, I can't tell you the dollar number yet because we're still working on that. We can, I believe, have better cosmesis with this. It's much more natural looking in the eye than having round holes. And we compromised on the back plate and put it in between the current back plate sizes at 7.8 millimeter because it's my impression that this will even fit children as well as pre-tight school smaller eyes and can be used in everybody. Now the type 2 clearly has limitations. We use this in very extreme circumstances and there's a picture of it. I don't have a pointer in the upper right. Here, socioeconomics and education also impact outcomes because patients with end-stage coronal blindness requiring this surgery are certainly much, much less common, but individual recipients require very intense ongoing care for best outcomes. So they require medications and they require visits and they have to have ready access to the surgeon or those complications can very quickly blind them. Another problem we see with the type 2, maybe not as commonly in some of the diseases that we see in the U.S., but as you leave uh, this country and see more chemical assaults and chemical injuries, you realize that sometimes the skin around the eyes is inadequate to allow for type 2 surgery. It, insufficient skin prevents proper closure, can lead to dead spaces beneath the lids as you try to hog the skin together. Typically would lead to retraction, which then leads to secondary coronal exposure, ulceration, and sometimes infection and loss of the eye. However, as with the osteodontal keratoprosthesis, prosthesis, bulbar mucous membrane grafting can afford a very suitable ocular surface that's stable over the long haul. And laboratory and very limited clinical experience now suggests that surface-modified titanium may offer better biocompatibility with the in the setting of a bulbar mucous membrane graft than does a PMA cylinder. And this is a paper, uh, it's going to be very hard in this room for you to see this, but this was Eleftherius Pascalis' work where he looked at surface roughness as a very simple modification of titanium, looked at a range of roughness ranging from polished, again, polishing is relative, if you look under EM you can see lines, but it's polished versus a rough sandblasted. And Eleftherius with his uh, colleagues went on to test this, and showed ex excellent uh, growth of cells on the 
principally the polished titanium. And if we look at the human coronal fibroblasts, if you look at the lower right, you can see rose bengal stained cells and see that the cells grew much more readily on polished titanium and distributed themselves better on polished titanium than they did on sandblasted titanium with a rough surface. Also on the right side, you can see that cells, fibroblasts that grew on the smooth titanium tended to be regular in orientation, whereas on the rough titanium, they were appeared disorganized, more like in a wounded state. So the hope is that uh, with smooth titanium surface adjacent to the tissue, that there would be less of a wounding uh, of the, that the cells would less experience a wounded microenvironment and there might be less tissue remodeling. So we have the type two keratoprosthesis shown here and we modified this in what we call the Lux modification and this involves a titanium cylinder. Well, it's a PMA cylinder that slots into a titanium K-Pro that includes a stem that would be against the cornea. It includes a titanium front plate and then the mucous membrane would sit uh, adjacent also to titanium. And this is an image from a patient who was operated on under humanitarian exemption because this device is not FDA reviewed yet. And it, with limited experience, so far so good. So we have a lot of work to do on this. This device would require a ball bar mucous membrane graft. It uses a Lucia backplate. It can be implanted in any cicatri cicatrizing disease. It would be principally uh, used in the short term in patients in whom eyelid scarring prevents eyelid closure. So you can send the patients for six to 12 months of repeated uh, facial skin grafts and eyelid surgeries, or you could do this. We're hoping that it has better, better tissue tolerance, uh, but we don't know yet. So in conclusion, the Boston keratoprosthesis type, type one and type two are effective solutions in the right patient. The type one device is expensive, which limits access to majority of coronal blind individuals worldwide. And the type two device cannot be utilized when facial scarring prevents eyelid closure. So we have some issues there. And I'm not focusing on infection or glaucoma retinal detachment here, which should be obvious to all of you. These are simply design changes that we're hoping to uh, implement to make things better for the patients that are currently needing it. The Lucia modification has the potential to reduce costs, making the device more widely available. And the Lux modification of the type two builds on the success of bulbar mucous membrane grafts and recent findings relative to titanium surfaces. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Dolman, my mentor, and uh, who's been extremely supportive in this work. And there he is with Professor Falcinelli. And even though he's here working hard, he still finds time for pleasure, as you can see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Wonderful talk as always. Um, next talk will be from our colleague, Dr. Charles Yu. He'll be, uh, he's from the University of Illinois. He'll be talking about incorporating 3D printing in the sign of a new prosthesis. Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Excellent. Um, thank you guys for inviting me to speak. My first time here. Um, one more moment as this loads up. And so, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, some 3D printing, but also uh, this flexible acrylic uh, prosthesis that we're working on. And, um, you know, we'd like to incorporate 3D printing more into design and development, but uh, still a bit limited in terms of the final materials that it can create. And we do have a disclosure that we're seeking a provisional patent on some of this work. Uh, I think everybody here is very familiar with the high-risk corneal transplantation. And we just had an excellent talk about the uh, Boston K-Pro. I just want to note that the front plate is made of PMMA, which is a, um, a very uh, you know, well-known, clear, and uh, well-tolerated material. 
And so in our, uh, as, as I started as new faculty, I was thinking of ways to uh, change the design or to perhaps to push it further. And uh, you know, PMMA has been used for many, many years, and uh, it was one of the early intraocular lenses were all made of PMMA. It has excellent optical properties. Uh, however, it is rigid, and so a large wound was required to insert these lenses, and uh, accordingly there was astigmatism and wound complications. And so now, you know, as I became an ophthalmologist, I always used these soft acrylic lenses, like the Acrosoft uh, from Alcon here. And these allowed uh, insertion of the lens through a small wound, and uh, also that allowed for faster healing, um, no need for sutures, less astigmatism, and also sh it was shown to have you know, very biocompatible and to have good optical properties. Uh, Acrosoft is made of uh, acrylic coat polymer, which we'll go into in a little while. And so as we mentioned, perhaps in a flexible uh, keratoprosthesis prosthesis could have smaller wound, faster surgery, faster recovery, and fewer complications. Uh, so using 3D printing, we came up with some early designs. And, uh, and here we have a preliminary, it, it looks very much like a Boston K-Pro with a bigger front plate and with arms that could fold together and be inserted through a smaller trephination. Uh, some of our CAD design had these uh, nutritive holes, but uh, we left those out of the, the final design, which we came up with here. So this is the design of our keratoprosthesis here. Uh, the front plate is six millimeters, the stem is three millimeters, and the back plate is nine millimeters total, and the arm is about three millimeters long each. There's eight arms. And uh, so using our 3D printer, we came up with, uh, we, we printed it out just to get a feel for it. And as you can see, it looks like a little octopus thing. And then, uh, so this 3D printer can make these prototypes very easily, but the material, of course, uh, is not something you could put in the eye and it's not clear enough. And so uh, we, uh, we used this as a way to prototype it, but when we moved on to coming up with a uh, uh, better material. So the uh, Alcon Acrosoft material is now off patent, but has a refractive index of 1.55. It's a copolymer of uh, phenoethylacrylate, PEA from now on, and phenoethylmethacrylate, PEMA from now on. And so here are the three molecules that come together. And, uh, and they're generally made using free radical uh, polymerization, where uh, heat generates a free radical from something like uh, benzoyl peroxide. And this attacks uh, these double bonds and uh, causes the formation of a uh, plastic um, clear material. And so we're able to replicate this in our experiments. We have a hexanodial as our uh, cross-linking agent, which is uh, just, uh, just seemed to work a little better for us. And then uh, incubating this material mix at uh, 24 hours or 70 degrees, we were able to create the, uh, basically the clear Acrosoft <coughs> material. Uh, it's also very flexible, and by altering the uh, concentration of the, the ratio of PEA and PEMA, you can change the flexibility uh, to your desired, um, desired level. So now that we had the material, we moved on to creating a mold design. And just using CAD, we came up with um, a five-piece design. And using 3D printing, we were able to create uh, a, a, you know, a one X scale uh, silver mold, and you pour the liquid inside. You bake this overnight, and you're uh, very carefully you can remove a, uh, a keratoprosthesis. So uh, here are some pictures of the keratoprosthesis. You can see it looks uh, just like uh, you know what we wanted to make. Uh, here's a custom clamp that uh, holds the arms together uh, during the insertion process, so that we're able to put it through a relatively small trephination. Uh, here's a higher uh, magnification. You can see some of the uh, some of the flaws, of course, in our first prototype are seen here. A few bubbles here and there, um, but uh, still very uh, quite clear in the center. And it has excellent properties of being flexible when warmed, uh, stays flexed when you cool it quickly, and then as it warms again in the body, just like how the eye well opens inside the eye, it then uh, spreads its arms inside the eye and holds it in shape. Uh, here is a ex vivo implantation, and you can see how the tissue is fixed, so it bends, it bends the soft material a little bit, and there's a bit of a gap. Um, so we moved on to an in vivo trial with a single rabbit thus far. And so here are some photos from that rabbit. Uh, this is our first time doing it. We're a little overcome. It, uh, and we broke capsule and some bit came forward, but uh, we were able to get the implant into place. Uh, let's go back one here. Yes, so as you can see, the arms of the implant are uh, nice and open in front of the iris in the bottom photo. Uh, here are some uh, operating microscope photos. And, uh, we see there's development of corneal NV as the, main, uh, as the main thing that we see here at week two, three, and four. And it stabilized about after week four. We have the rabbit at week six right now. Uh, here are some corresponding slit lamp photos. Uh, just some mucus on the first eye. Um, but we can see that wave of inflammation and neovascularization go past the K-Pro now. And uh, here's that week two demonstrating a uh, side-down negativity that was not leak noted at any time during our examinations around the front plate. 
Uh, we have also did anterior segment OCTs. And we do note that there's some vitreous and iris behind it, but uh, there's an excellent seal around the edge of the optic and uh, no evidence of breakdown or leakage. There's some swelling as that wave of NV goes past, uh, which, which you can see at week four resolves uh, a little bit. So our single rabbit conclusion is that there was no extrusion or infection or membrane formation at six weeks. The IOP uh, was measured reliably so, and it was less than 20. Uh, there was no leakage. Uh, we do need optimized lens removal. We'll probably do FACO on these next time. And we're also revising on making the arms just a little uh, tapered so that they're easier to insert through a small trephination. So the anticipated benefits are, as we mentioned, faster surgery, no need for corneal tissue, no need for sutures, and, um, and perhaps a few complications related to not having the grafts in place. Our challenges are uh, improving our manufacturing standards, improving our surgical technique, and considering which patients might uh, benefit from this kind of surgery. Our next steps are to improve our production quality, uh, to develop a better inserter that holds the arms uh, very, uh, a little bit smaller, uh, in vitro biocompatibility studies, but we do, are confident that this material is used in IOLs and should uh, have good biocompatibility, and a larger in vivo trial of rabbits and another animal is needed. Uh, I'd like to thank Mark, Jose, and Soldat and at UIC, my uh, innovation center, my students, and my grad support. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Charles. Wonderful talk. Uh, now we're going to open it up unless we have – Jolene is not here. So we're going to open it up to discussion and questions uh, to any of the speakers. You, you want to go ahead and start some questions? Congratulations from me as well for this nice meeting and this uh, very interesting first session. I, I did very carefully listen to the presentations and uh, as I'm from the old world, uh, I have some old world wisdom and questions. And uh, the first question uh, goes to uh, Dr. Elisif. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, uh, with the vitrification, I would like to know uh, whether uh, the um, uh, whether you would expect that the collagen implant would, uh, due to vitrification, also resist uh, uh, enzymatic destruction. Because we recently have um, implanted a collagen, a self-produced collagen implant. It was uh, uh, plastically compressed, and we did see a lot of retraction, and, and uh, what we presumed that was in the human eye, uh, with a compassionate use approach, but we did see some form of resorption. So w would you expect that to be uh, beneficial with vitrification? Uh, so with some of the vitrification procedures, we do cross-link also um, some. But even with or without cross-linking, you do enhance the stability of the implants. And um, I think it really depends if you get that advanced collagen structure, right? So if you saw those fibers and the banding pattern of that collagen, you're really organizing the, um, the trupal helices into these larger bundles, which are going to take longer to um, degrade. But I really, um, when it comes down to enzymatic de degradation, I think that's really going to be an inflammatory um, um, result. So depending on the local environment is going to really dictate how quickly your um, implant degrades. And as we're starting to explore sort of the inflammatory environment in the cornea a little bit more in depth, um, I think that's going to really dictate your, your implant. So if you cross-link it or you don't, or you increase the fibrils or you don't, you'll see something in vitro and your enzymatic degradation changes in vitro. But um, I don't know if that always correlates to in vivo um, stability, which can depend on so many other factors um, with the epithelialization and um, the surgical technique for how you implant it. So you can increase the um, um, resistance to enzymatic digestions in a dish, but there are a lot more factors that go into in people. Any more questions for Dr. Elisi? No. Any other question to any other speaker? Paul. Oh. The question to Jim. Uh, regarding the lentil implant, uh, would we know that uh, the prostopathic care is probably more important than the surgical procedure itself? Do you think it is manageable to do a prostate cancer in poor countries? Well, we know that uh, often they do not follow instruction, they do not come back to follow us. 
Maybe I can follow on to this question. Would you advocate to use vancomycin, eye drops, and bandage contact lens with, uh, with those models? Uh, I presume. Further questions? Well, I'd also like to uh, ask uh, the gentleman uh, from Gore and Associates, uh, uh, because we have some experience with um, at least, again, compassionate use, uh, Gore-Tex patch implantation into the ocular surface for patients with non-healing uh, ulcers, corneal ulcers. And uh, while we see early good uh, integration it has never become epithelialized. So uh, I think you touched upon um, the topic of uh, surface modification. Uh, but we also have seen Gore-Tex uh, implants with surface modification uh, without being able to give you details. What was the modifying uh, molecule uh, which uh, were extruded? So um, what do you think will be the, the secret uh, to your device uh, really to, to change this uh, landscape? Or come forward and use the microphone because <laughs> I can't. Yeah. So we are aware that our gold patch material is being used in other parts of the body other than the hernia patches. But one thing that has to be very... Okay, is that good? <laughs> okay. So let me repeat again. Um, I think we are aware that our gold patch material is used in other parts of the body although it was specifically designed for pore structure and everything, surface modification that's needed for the hernia patch. So if anybody wants to use it for any other purposes, rather than getting it just out and trying to put it in other uses, if we can get involved and try to understand what that application is and what kind of surface modification is needed, what kind of pore structure is needed, so we would be able to help that situation. And I fully agree with you. I might have given the wrong impression. Back 20 years ago, we did not have technology and know-how in these polymers, nor did we know where it came from. So we basically implanted polytetrafluoroethylene expanded coming from a, not the manufacturer itself, but somebody that would sell it to or in, or in Germany or somewhere else. We never had any contact, so whatever we got, the poor dif uh, dimensions and the structures, we had absolutely no knowledge about it, except doing scanning it for microscopy ourselves on a sample and believing all the other samples were the same. It was not. But with you on the hand, I'm confident that this will be working. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, thank you. So, 
Um, there's a question here for, for, for Dr. Yu. Sorry, but please come forward and ask as well. It's not only me who has to ask questions. Is uh, when you um, uh, try to uh, 3D print uh, a prosthesis, you've heard about pore size being important, not only material. Mm -hmm. Do you think you can incorporate in, in the 3D printing process the wisdoms that we've learned from history or from uh, new developments? I mean, can you print these with uh, decent pore size, for example? Would you be able to coat this material afterwards? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, certainly, um, yes. uh, certainly the 3D printing material comes with a, a, you know, a basic minimum pore size that may allow for uh, you know, high surface area coating and um, I don't have any personal experience in it um, but I think it's certainly possible and um, and currently uh, currently there's just no clear biocompatible material that we've seen available with 3D printers and I think that is a, a very important uh, next step with uh, if we can have that uh, then uh, care of prosthesis can be made with 3D printers much easier. Are we up for time? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions to the speakers? If that's not the case, then we conclude the session? Yes. Okay. We conclude the first session so that we keep moving along so we can keep on time. Uh, then we'll ask the uh, moderators from the free uh, paper session, Dr. Mark Rosenblatt and Dr. Michael Bellin. I thank you for moderating. <laughs> <laughs> And then our, just to remind the uh, speakers of the free paper session that they each uh, uh, free paper will be uh, six minutes. And then I'll, I'll again, Dr. Michael Bellin from uh, Arizona and Dr. Mark Rosenbaum from Chicago. And we'll ask the uh, first speaker, Miguel Gonzalez from the uh, Mass Signer. He will present uh, one step closer to a more practical artificial cornea. And I'll hand it over to my colleagues from this point on. Hello, um, I'm not uh, Miguel Gonzalez. I'm uh, presenting on behalf of Miguel. He just had a, a baby and uh, he was uh, unable to attend the meeting. I think you're going to have a problem. <laughs> it seems like it. Okay. Yeah. It seems like a loose connection, yeah. Keep doing that. I can take it off. Put it back in. Let's see. Even worse. Have to drop down that. Uh, you want me to put it over there? Can put it over there? Okay. 
So I think we're, we're good. So I would like to thank the organizers uh, for uh, uh, inviting us here to present today. Uh, as Dr. Dolman has stated many times, and you probably know, uh, despite significant progress over the two centuries of interest in prostocaratoplasty, no single caper yet incorp incorporates all desirable features. Unfortunately, several surgeons have had difficulty in cornea assembly and Boston keratoprosthesis or have had postoperative device complications in spite of manuals, courses, etc. Pre-assembly by a skilled technician, perhaps in an eye bank, might save the surgeon time, add safety for the patient, enhance supply, facilitate storage and shipment, and reduce administrative cost. TBI has already developed the techniques for gamma radiation for uh, corneal um, uh, donor grafts, and such a technique could be perhaps used in our case, um, given that we pre-assemble the Boston keratoprosthesis and uh, with a corneal graft and gamma irradiated for sterilization. So before we move on to this project, we had to um, start looking at the effect of gamma radiation on the material and also on the assembled uh, capro uh, itself. So we looked thus far um, and we performed optical evaluation, mechanical evaluation, cell biocompatibility, and stability of the combination of the pre-assembled capro. Of course, everything will have to be um, first FDA approved. In the optical evaluation, we didn't see any deleterious effect of gamma radiation. We tried 10, 25, 50 kilograms. 25 is the standard for um, sterilization. And uh, in the visible spectrum, uh, the absorbance or the transmittance of light was similar to that of control PMMA or ethylene oxide, which is the standard way that we clean right now the Boston keratoprosthesis. We saw some reduction in the, in the uh, transmittance in the lower wavelengths uh, and, uh, at the UV, but that was not uh, significant, or at least that would be beneficial for the patient. This, this was attributed to the yellowish color that uh, the PMMA gets after gamma radiation. We looked at the mechanical, at mechanical evaluation using nano indentation, and uh, as you see here, the ethylene oxide and the 10 kilo, uh, 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 kilogray uh, performed similarly. There was a slight increase in the 50 kilogray, but that was not um, signif uh, statistically significant. Now, looking at cell biocompatibility, we looked at uh, HACL cells, humor corneal limbal epithelial cells, and as you can see here, the top um, the top figure is a rose bengal staining. Um, the uh, cells proliferated si uh, similarly. The first uh, picture is a control uh, uh, tissue culture uh, plastic. The second is an ethylene oxide treated PMMA, and the third is a gamma radiated with 25 kilogram. All cells um, expressed nuisance at, uh, when stratified, which exclude rose bengal stain. We also looked at, uh, uh, at the ability of uh, 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 cornea fibroblasts. These were uh, primary cultures and we saw no difference in uh, differentiation of fibroblasts between the, ch uh, the, the different um, ways of sterilization. We also looked at the uh, cell apoptosis using a live dead assay and uh, gamma radiation did not really cause any change in cell apoptosis or cell death. Finally, we wanted to check the stability of the pre-assembled combination uh, after 25 kilogram of uh, irradiation. This is the minimum dose necessary for sterilization. Um, for that purpose, we pre-assembled a big Boston keratoprosthesis device into a fresh graft, dropped it into a vial with 5% dextrin, and then we gamma irradiated this uh, vial with 25 kilogram, and we left it sit for five months in room temperature and then we took it out and we looked whether the tissue that we pre-assembled had any signs of 
retraction or thinning or any ill effects, and we couldn't find anything on the tissue. Thus, this um, is the flowchart that we envision. Um, of course, a lot, of, a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, as you can see here, fresh graft, frozen or dehydrated cross-linked corneas can be pre-assembled with the Boston keratoprosthesis. I have left the xenograft and the constructs in red because they are not yet ready for, pri for prime time, but they might be um, in the near future. Then mm -hmm, this pre-assembled uh, Boston keratoprosthesis can be uh, sterilized with gamma radiation and then stored uh, stored uh, uh, for shipment, and um, the surgeon can have a stock of them, and they, he can use them whenever needed. So there's no reason of urgent um, uh, deliveries. So in conclusion, sterilization of the Boston ker keratoprosthesis using gamma radiation has no detectable influence on the biocompatibility, mechanical, or optical properties of the device. There are advantages of pre-assembled Boston keratoprosthesis. For example, storage and shipment is facilitated. Uh, unburden the surgeon from assembly time in the EOR. Eliminate need for fresh graft ordering and uh, delivery, which will reduce the administrative cost. And also, it, uh, ha it will have less complications during the assembly, which is a lot safer for the patients. Thank you very much. All questions will be saved to the end during the discussion period. Our next speaker, Heather Durfee. I'm not ready yet. I have to wait for this. Um, my name is Heather Durkee. I'm from um, the Ophthalmic Biophysics Center with Dr. Perel at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. And today I'm going to present a single case of a titanium type backplate um, that was um, exchanged at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. And prior to the exchange, it was examined with um, optical coherence tomography and then. After explantation, I examined it with confocal microscopy. Um, I'd like to thank my support and um, all the people who helped me. So as I said, the purpose was to examine a, confocal, uh, a type titanium backplate type K-Pro with confocal microscopy and OCT. Um, the patient was undergoing a K-Pro exchange um, from a sterile melt, and prior to the exchange, anterior segment uh, OCT was performed. Um, so to start, this is the confocal microscopy results. You can see here on the anterior surface, the anterior surface is on the left. Um, there's some, on the top part of the optic, there's some sort of biofilm deposition. And then on the, you can see this here in a magnified view. And then in the interior, so the posterior surface, you can see a membrane covering the optical, um, the optic part of the, Capro. Um, and this is it in high magnification. And this is the OCT image, and you can see here at the stem of the Capro, there's a little bit of separation, which is what the physician um, noticed and why he wanted to do the explantation. Let's see here. This is a different cross section. And then finally, here in the inferior part. 
Sorry, I'm really bad at using microphones. <laughs> um, so this patient was explanted for a sterile melt, but you can see that there was bi biofilm on the anterior surface and more into the stem of where the donor tissue was. Um, and multiple imaging modalities such as OCT and the Capro after explantation may help in better understanding reasons for sterile Capro melt. And um, smooth, smooth super polished surfaces may be better suited for K standard Capro types inside the eye rather than titanium, which is also biocompatible in different applications. Thank you. Uh, I'm back. Okay. Let's hope this time it works. Okay. So again, thank you for um, giving us the opportunity here to present. Uh, the topic of my presentation is caper surgery and chemical burns can cause retinal and optic nerve damage via inflammation. Treatment with infliximab is protective. As uh, you know, um, ocular alkali burns are indeed the most deleterious injuries that can happen into an eye. Treatment is very difficult and uh, standard penetrating keratoplasty is almost always unsuccessful. However, Using the Boston keratoprosthesis, we can achieve very good long-term retention in such cases. However, to our dismay, the restored media clarity often revealed glaucoma. And this is a picture that uh, caper surgeons probably know. In addition, alkali burned Boston keratoprosthesis patients progress to end-stage glaucoma faster than other Boston keratoprosthesis patients. This was a study published by Alia. So that really means that there is something, uh, a component within the alkali burn that leads to this progression. We recently showed that the alkali cannot reach the retina by diffusion. Uh, rather, cornea alkali burn causes a massive upregulation of uh, key pro-inflammatory cytokines. One of these cytokines is tumor necrosis factor alpha, that then diffuses back to the retina. This event causes apoptosis, and this is a significant apoptosis, as you can see with red is tunnel, green is BRN3A for retina ganglion cells and blue is DAPI. So it causes a massive apoptosis in the ganglion cell layer the, within 24 hours. This is an animal model, a, a mouse model. During this time, the pH in the retina and in the supracorial space, and when I say retina, I, I mean in the vitreous, remains unchanged and the IOP does not elevate. As a next step, we found a TNF alpha causes activation of retina microglia and subsequent, subsequent phagocytosis of neuronal tissue. The green are CX3, CR1 positive cells, which are the microglia, and the red is neuronal tissue, uh, RNFL, and you can see here a process of phagocytosis. Now, very important, a single intraperitoneal injection of infliximab uh, immediately after the burn, 15 minutes after the burn, uh, reduces inflammation abrogates retina ganglion cell apoptosis and microglia reactivity. We have also demonstrated that, uh, and this is a work which was published recently by Steve uh, Zhu, uh, that subconjunctival uh, uh, application of a drug-eluting polymer for, for uh, anti-TNF-alpha for infliximab, even at very low amounts, is neuroprotective. So we have published last month in the American Journal of Pathology uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the mechanism that we believe that explains the retinal damage in chemical burns. So alkali injury in the anterior chamber causes, uh, in, in, on the cornea, causes anterior chamber pH elevation. 
and massive inflammation in the cornea and iris. The pH is diffused probably by the lens and the iris. It doesn't go back to the retina. TNF-alpha is generated in the anterior uh, segment and iris and rapidly diffuses posteriorly and that causes a secondary wave of inflammation where now tissue resident uh, macrophages and immune cells from, from the blood are secreting their own TNF-alpha. This damages the retinal ganglion cells and sets the basis of retinal inflammation and glaucoma. So in conclusion, ocular burns can cause inflammatory retinal damage. TNF-alpha is a key mediator. It's not the only mediator, but is a key mediator. Prompt anti-TNF-alpha treatment is highly protective, especially for the retina. This neuroprotective regimen may also uh, be suitable for other surgical inflammations, uh, inflammatory traumas, and you pretty much know that, uh, and there are more publications coming out that and posters right now at Arvo that they say that Boston keratoprosthesis or uh, continuous and failed PKs can actually cause more glaucoma. So we have some future directions that we are working. Prompt delivery of anti-inflammatory biologics, for instance, infliximab, subconjunctivally, it is a very good route. In the emergency room, primarily this is for neuroprotection. Uh, this, in addition to standard lavas and corticosteroids, which are both found to be relatively ineffective, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, uh, full dose for maximal IOP lowering, extend for at least a month, perhaps keratoprosthesis implantation in a later quiet state, for example, six months after the burn and after treatment, more IOP lowering, more biologics. Thus, Combination of early neuroprotection, sustained IOP lowering, and eventual uh, keratoprosthesis surgery may markedly improve outcomes after chemical burns. I would like to uh, acknowledge Dr. Dolmans. Um, he's been uh, a continuous supporter of this work, chemical burns, and he has been funding uh, my work for the last six years. Uh, Dr. James Chodos for his uh, support he is a person to ask if you have questions, very knowledgeable. Uh, my fellows, uh, Steve, which is Seng Xing Yu, Zhu, uh, in, in Chinese, Feng Yang Lei, uh, Dylan, he's doing a lot of work in the immunology. Vasiliki Kapuleas, he's doing a lot of quantification with uh, uh, monocytes. And of course, my collaborators, Dimitrios Vavas, Dana Razor, and Larissa Gelfer, uh, that you probably know, she is the heart of the Cabro. I would like to take the opportunity and invite you to the 30th Biennial Cornea Conference, uh, which will be held in Boston. Uh, that's going to be October 13, 14. Uh, There's going to be um, a day before that uh, poster session. And uh, we should take this opportunity because we're going to be celebrating also Dr. Klaas Dolman's 60 years of continuous contribution to corneal science and education. Thank you very much.
The next email. talk is up. We can yes. perhaps um, do that. Yeah. Jean Marie, yeah. should we do yours first? It's up to you. Can you unplug um, his talk? Mm -hmm. yeah. What I'm going to do is take this. What are we using? I'm going to take it in a minute. 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 Discussing the mighty paper. I said this is what that's going to arise if we can learn from the OKP and Boston paper. Yeah, I noticed that somebody changed the program. So instead of eight minutes, now I only have six. Yeah. You changed it, huh? Okay. I should have known. <laughs> yes, I know. Time, not less. So you get the full eight minutes. Oh, oh you're so sorry. Thank you. Come on, come on. Okay, um, I went a little too fast, sorry. So at Bascom Palmer, we had a bit of everything, including MOKP, a lot of Boston people. Sorry, I'm still French, you know, can't speak loud. I try to be soft. Anyway, so uh, Dr. Falcinelli came to Bascom Palmer and trained us in the MOKP, and several patients were implanted with uh, MOKP. And of course, as you probably know, we also implant a lot of Boston K Pro, type 1 and type 2. So I wanted to first acknowledge a lot of people. And the purpose of a project was to replace uh, the MOKP and OKP biological construct biosynthetic mesoplant that would fit with Giancarlo Falcinelli's philosophy and avoid the problem with bone degradation, which occurred in two of the three patients that uh, Victor Perez implanted, with one of the optic found in the vitreous cavity. And of course, the patient was not in Miami, but elsewhere by the time he came to Bascom Palmer and of Thermatis. So, what we came up with using dental titanium, not the ordinary titanium, and the reason is because one of us is a maxillofacial surgeon and implants false teeth all the time using titanium. And that works with buccal mucosa. So we married what Giancarlo taught us about protection of the ocular surface with buccal mucosa and the titanium. And we tried not to enter into the anterior chamber and use high quality PMMA optics that we could not make in our laboratory. So the first thing was to figure out what does the patient really see if he has an MOKP, uh, a Boston K-Pro 1, or this new device? We use a digital camera, which is a little special. It's mirrorless, 
It's a huge, a huge uh, sensor, and you can actually walk around using the optic of the Boston K Pro or whatever type of optic, walk around and image what the patient really sees. So here are three video clips showing what the patient with MOKP, Boston Type 1, or the MITI K Pro sees. We can also look at uh, still images, as you can see, and assess resolution. And we can also go around and find out the obstacle. When you have a huge surface, I mean a huge uh, field of view, you are in better shape than if you have a smaller field of view. But notice all the reflex, the glare that these optics generate. This can be minimized or even eliminated with better optics and a better design. So even a Miti K Pro, which is the last one, not good enough, in my opinion. And you can go in the lab and surprisingly the illuminate. Oh. I don't know why this one doesn't work. No, sorry about that. Okay, you can go in the lab and all of a sudden you are not in natural illumination but whatever the university will pay, fluorescent or uh, LEDs or whatnot. And the amount of glare that comes in is terrible. This is what the patient sees. We got to really fix that. This is in the lab, same thing, same problem. Now, if your patient goes and sits at the desktop and looks, wants to search something uh, in Google, look at the problem he or she has. Very difficult to read the screen, finding the right keys, Certainly with MOKP is almost impossible. I have to say, we got this implant from Professor Falcinelli, who bought it from India. It's not something we make up. And the Boston Tape 1 came from uh, Dr. Victor Perez. He had not used it. The Miti K Pro was kind of homemade. Patients also have problem reading newspaper or journals as you can see here. We need to improve this. This is not acceptable. And optically, it's possible. We also look at uh, visual acuity. This is MOKP. Not very good, is it? Boston Type 1 is much better. And the Miti K Pro is even a little better. We can compare them, and we can look at the finest vision. So what we have found is that we can replicate how K-Pro and a more KP patient sees, as well as Miti K-Pro in the future. We can use this to better uh, make the optics and refine the whole system. Well, let me tell you in three minutes what happened. We actually built the first prosthesis. We actually using the contralateral eye of a rabbit we had to enucleate did the test, this is really accelerated, found that it took more time to actually pre-place the eighth suture to fit it onto the eye and um, to actually get the buccal mucosa, which is coming up in a second, and then fixation to the mucosa, etc., etc., opening it up and then checking the optics. In reality, we had problem with respect to recreate neovascularization that happened in one of your patients. The buccal mucosa in a rabbit, very small, and if you only use half of the mouth, it's not enough to cover. So we have to use both sides. The implant is too big for the rabbit. The mucosa thickness is much, much thinner than in, in patient. We can actually do some good optical thing. So here are what we found. One of the important things, we had no infection, no inflammation, no intraocular hemorrhage, 
no corneal decompensation. No, we kept that crystalline lens intact. We had no cataract, no retroprosthetic membrane formation in the four healthy rabbits. And the retina remained clearly visible. So we made a third generation, which is smaller, thinner, and we will start uh, rabbit studies this summer. Thank you very much. presentation finally working. <laughs> so uh, my name is Jay. I'm one of the residents at Mass Sionier. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you to the organizers. So I'm going to be talking about um, outcomes of uh, Bosman keratoprosthesis type 1 uh, re-implantation or repeat implantation. Um, so, so you've seen this picture a couple times today. Um, basically, you know, um, we know that Capro has been increasingly used in patients uh, who have failed corneal grafts or who um, are deemed unlikely to have a success with the corneal graft. Um, and the outcomes um, of the uh, implantation in general have been quite good. There's been multiple studies that have looked at this. Um, the visual acuity outcomes um, are favorable, and retention rates have been around 90% at two years. Um, however, um, the KPROs do fail. Um, and the main reasons why they fail uh, are listed above uh, extrusion is one. Um, dense retroprosthetic membrane sometimes can necessitate removal of the uh, prosthesis. Sterile keratolysis or melt, which isn't fully understood, but it's thought to uh, be related to activation of matrix metalloproteinases. And infection, both bacterial and fungal. Um, so when a capo fails, there are a few options um, to uh, consider. One is uh, tectonic keratoplasty. Um, for more uh, anatomical salvage, and um, the other is to do a repeat implantation of uh, uh, Capro, either type 1 or type 2. Um, so there isn't that much data on um, outcomes of repeat uh, Capro implantation. The question is, is, are they as good as the outcomes for initial implantation? Um, there's one previous study out there um, that looked at this um, from 2015 out of uh, UCLA, uh, they uh, reported seven failures out of 36. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, from here. That's right. Yeah, I misspoke. <laughs> yeah, so um, basically there were seven failures out of 36 repeat uh, KPROs, and um, that uh, comes up to about 80% retention rate. Um, and uh, the main findings there were two-thirds achieved uh, 2200 vision and achieve, achieving 2200 after initial KPRO uh, vision was associated with achieving the same vision after repeat KPRO. And also eyes with OCP, SGS, chemical or thermal burn and severe dry eye were uh, more likely to fail. Um, and so we wanted to see if, um, um, you know, we could get results that were consistent with these. Um, so uh, what we did is looked at um, out of a um, out of one of our previous uh, multicenter studies, looked at the eyes that underwent a repeat implantation. Out of 303, there were 13 that needed repeat capro implantation, um, and these 13 eyes were then matched uh, by diagnosis with 13 control eyes, which were basically initial capro uh, implantations. Um, and those were selected from 149 eyes um, with complete demographic data, and those were se uh, selected randomly. And our outcome measures were retention and uh, visual acuity. So uh, this is just a summary of um, the uh, sort of the clinical data. Uh, the mean follow-up follow time was 17 months, uh, with a range of 2 to 56. Um, the uh, diagnoses included um, the largest largest group was. Um, uh, SJS or OCP with five patients uh, in each group, and you can see the rest listed there. Um, the miscellaneous um, is uh, for the control group is a, a corneal scar, and then for the repeat group is exposure keratopathy. Um, and you know, one patient in each group uh, failed uh, KPRO. 
Uh, and so the, uh, the cause of the failure uh, first was extrusion in the initial capo group, and in the repeat capo group was due to fungal keratitis. Uh, and then we looked at in our uh, group of uh, patients that needed repeat capros, what was the cause of the initial capro failure? And in those patients, uh, sterile melt and fungal infection were the two largest uh, most common causes. Uh, so here's a, just uh, in um, a box and whisker plot of the uh, visual acuity outcomes. You have the control and the repeat side by side from pre-op all the way to the final vision. And a couple of trends to notice, the, they do look pretty similar. There was no statistical uh, significant difference between the two groups. Um, and you do see a, a, an improvement in the vision, um, uh, which seems to uh, be greatest at post-op month six. And then afterwards, you get a wider range of visual acuities, um, and that's often due to posterior segment pathology, such as glaucoma and retinal detachment. Um, and, and those causes were also similar in the two groups. Um, so you have retinal detachment, progression of glaucoma, and uh, extrusion in the initial capo group, and um, retinal detachment, glaucoma, suprachoroidal hemorrhage in the repeat capo group. But interestingly, all of these patients had a preoperative vision of count fingers uh, or worse. Um, so looking at some um, uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curves, uh, the time to achieve 2200 was similar in the two groups with a median time of 0 0.62 months. Um, and also time to lose was, uh, so, so in, out of patients that achieved 2200, in the control group none of the eyes lost the 2200, but in the repeat group there were two eyes that lost 2200. One patient uh, was due to RPM um, and after mem membranectomy improved to 2060. The other patient was due to a retinal detachment that was considered to be inoperable and ended up being LP. So in conclusion, the visual and anatomical outcomes of repeat implantation we found were similar to those of initial capo implantation, consistent with the uh, prior study. And we also found that fungal infection was a significant cause of capro loss and um, should be uh, looked at uh, uh, clinically. Um, and uh, repeat capro implantation should be considered as a viable option for patients with failed initial capro, especially if the preoperative visual acuity is favorable. Thank you to Dr. Rodnitsky, Dr. Mellon, Dr. Cialino uh, for helping me with uh, this study and the rest of the Boston uh, Type 1 Capro study group. Mm -hmm. We have a little over 10 minutes for open to discussion. I'm going to throw out our first question. Jean Marie, uh, first of all, I thought those videos of simulated vis vision was great. Uh, I have a question, a thought on, with the Boston K-Pro, we normally fit it with a soft contact lens, which has its own optical properties and maybe uh, a better aspherical. I don't know what the design or the asphericity of the Boston K-Pro. It would be interesting to uh, redo that with the Boston K-Pro with the soft contact lens to see if it has any effect on the glare. Just a thought. Because that would give another reason in addition to but we have potentially use a contact. Actually, Why don't you come up for the mic? Tell me you did it already. <laughs> Actually, we're redesigning the system to accommodate for Essence uh, new capo, which is a completely different design. And we will actually modify um, a model I as commercially available and we have fluid inside and a one inch camera at the back to actually put right up front here and let the person walk around and while we will record with a Wi-Fi system, being able to show the differences and learn from it, yeah. including contact lenses. Thank you for the <coughs> Why don't we open up uh, broadly for questions? I know these were extending inter an interesting uh, presentation. So first, perhaps uh, address any questions folks in the audience might have. Well, I would like to know from the first speaker why you think that uh, shipping will be easier when you the paper mounted onto a piece of human tissue because this is usually considered a little more biohazard. I know it's uh, gamma irradiated. 
Well, it's not easier to ship it. The shipping will be the same process as now. The difference will be that uh, the, the, the convenience to the server. Can I take that question? It's, it's really dear and near to my heart, this area. Um, actually, the paper was our paper um, that they showed, Dr. Acavella, Tony Aldave, and I put together uh, a few cases where we used um, the irradiated cornea. The main problem outside of U.S. Um, with the Boston Capro is the lack of donor cornea. Even though we don't need good corneas, not transplantation quality, the donor cornea is still a problem, especially in Middle East and, uh, for example, China, probably in other countries as well. Um, it isn't that it is easier to ship the Capro when you combine it. It's easier to ship the cornea because um, irradiated cornea does not require any special storage. You can ship it at room temperature. You can put it in, a, in an envelope and mail it. Two years of shelf life at room temperature. So, I mean, obviously, it's not the solution to the worldwide blindness yet, but it's a good solution for the time being for surgeons who can't use Boston Capro because they don't have um, means of getting corneas. Maybe because of the eye banking issues, which require a lot of storage and, and regulations and everything, also collection of the donors too. So that, um, I'm actually very pleased to see this study. Um, in the interim, until we get a better artificial cornea, this will be very helpful for some of my colleagues. I, I like to congratulate the authors. So this study was based on your publication, in essence. I am very and pleased to see it. And in addition to what uh, uh, Dr. Akbar just said, it's also um, uh, illuminating errors. And even though that this doesn't sound uh, something realistic or something that really happens, it happens. It happens. Yeah. When you let a, a tra even I mean, I think that presbyopia is also a thing. Like, I used to never use the microscope to cut my corneas, but nowadays I have to use a microscope to cut the corneas. When you tilt the three millimeter punch slightly, the inner opening and the outer opening are not matched, and there's a space between those two. One is elliptical, one is roundish, and that can cause actually leaks. It happened to me in the OR once. So that's when um, we decided, I think it's a, it's a good idea to um, eliminate one more step. I'd like to um, uh, just say a correction. Dr. Belen Akovella, um, Sadir, uh, several of us in, in the, um, in the um, group were um, authors in that paper that Massainia resident, unfortunately, messed up. It's not a UCLA study. It's, it's, um, so what you're saying <laughs> is many of us have problems that we've explained it. Yes, yeah. we have. Uh, but one, um, one thing I like to say, if the pre-op vision was good and if the patient, whatever the reason for why we had to explain has been now fixed, the outcome is good. Actually, Sumei is, is in the audience. She's the first author of, the, um, of that paper. Before you sit down, let me and ask Sumei you a question. Sumei is a resident. Before you sit down, <laughs> let me ask you a question about the pre-assembled. Yes. One of the concerns, if someone says this is a pre-assembled, is that often ahead of time, I don't know exactly the size that I would like to use of yes. the donor cornea. So what size do you anticipate, and uh, is the, quote, inexperienced surgeon in the field going to have to then resize that to be more applicable to the patient? Well, so these, I mean, I, uh, well, well, by the way, I am the National Medical Director of um, TBI, which is now Carolink, I do have financial interest. I get a, a very small stipend from TBI, but um, these corneas come in nine millimeter outer oh. diameter, so they're more than enough. You can um, triff and and, and uh, resize it if you want. I like to use a seven millimeter back plate, so I don't need anything more than an eight, actually. But it's up to the surgeon. I think it's it's a good study. Have you tried tree finding? after the assembly is done. No, no, That's a great other words, idea. Because I'm not sure, ma many of us use a vacuum punch, yes. and I'm not sure the vacuum punch would be applicable once you've put it together. 
So you may actually, in theory, think it's easier, but may turn out to be in the field to be actually harder to use. Well, just to try on a not on flat the, surface. Correct. The front plate will make the yeah. tissue. So I think you, you definitely need to. I actually try use a Teflon block and freehand it, um, just like what I do for larger size grafts. Um, I just do that and. Um, Dr. Acovella might have an idea because he was working on assembling, uh, I mean, uh, making a, a device um, for yeah, assembly, yeah. but yeah. But I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's optional, obviously. It might help some of the surgeons greatly. Yeah, Dr. I clearly covered some early, early onset presbyopia. Um, uh, um, one question I had for our, uh, our, our discussant uh, about the, um, using the infliximab. Um, you, you mentioned it only in the abstract, but what is the timing? Um, because often we don't know that a patient's going to require um, a K-Pro uh, perhaps years later. What is the window of opportunity to use an anti-TNF agent um, after an alkali burn? So in, in an animal model, uh, in, in mice, uh, TNF receptor upregulation happens within uh, four hours. Four hours and six hours for our treatment. So I will suggest that the, the time, the window, will be the first four hours. Now, a larger eye might take longer. We, we have seen that in, in rabbit work. In rabbit work, it takes longer to see the apoptosis, more than 24 hours sometimes. And uh, it's basically the dynamics, the, the, the size is different. So I would say that what's the realistic scenario of chemical burn? How soon are you in the emergency room? It's probably within four hours, right? So that would probably cover um, this probability and be uh, efficacious. Before you sit down, any other delivery options that may be useful in the ER besides sub subcons, which may be prob problematic? Well, the, most of the study that I have presented are is systemic IP intraperitoneal. We developed a sub we developed a polymer uh, not to put it subcontractively, but to put it in the lower lead phonics in the sac. The reason okay. we put it in the, in the subcontractive space was because uh, rabbits won't tolerate it. They will take it out. We just saw that th there was an effect also in the retina. Now we're exploring the possibility of injection, subcontractive injection. And the reality is that in an emergency room, whoever is there, he's not going to be a specialist, a retina specialist. So uh, giving an intravitreal injection, I think, is out of the question. Uh, IV, it's easy. Everybody knows what to do. And perhaps a soft contact travel injection could be something for So IV, I think, is the gold standard as we look at it. Thank you. IV is feasible. You administer it at day zero, two weeks, six weeks, and then every... You only need a single dose of the in the chemical therapy. You only need one dose. How much? 6.25 milligrams per kilogram. Well, good <laughs> Much of the remarkable thing with this is that the minute amounts of the infliximab that you give subcontinentally, less than one microgram per day, has a profound effect on immunity on uh, neural protection. Can, can we expand this to other indications, or are you yes. just talking about the birth? I mean, this is so fascinating. So the for the reason we have for other biologics and anti agents. So the reason uh, uh, started that. Published, basically describes that the, chem the retinal damage uh, after chemical burn is a model. It's not the, the pH that goes back and does whatever happens. It's the anterior chamber inflammation. Of course, this can be extended to any kind of surgical traumas. Uh, the, the, the chemical burn <coughs> is a very harsh model and it's very accelerated. That's why we like it. But of course, people have recognized already that multiple PKs and a lot of corneal traumas can actually also, retinal uh, inflammation, activation of the immune cells, and retinal damage. So we think, yes, infliximab may be applicable even protective, as a protective regimen for, uh, for corneal surgery. I mean, even if other patients receiving capos, yes. the initial injury was not they didn't, they didn't have a capo. Thank you. We're going to keep everyone on time and head into the second session of free papers. Thank you. It was a very insightful and uh, great uh, talks. So thank you to all the speakers for the free papers. We're going to the last uh, session.
uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and this will be moderated by our colleagues, Dr. Jim Shodas from Mass Sinai and Dr. Sadir Hanosh from uh, Bullseye Hospital. So I'm going to bring uh, Sumaya Ahmad from ICANN School of Medicine. She's going to talk about, and the title is Artificial Corneal Transplantation versus Donor Corneal Transplantation. Escape or being underutilized, and then from this I'll pass it on to my colleagues for the rest of the session. Welcome. Okay, so the first speaker is here, uh, Dr. Ahmad from Mount Sinai is going to tell us about the comparison of artificial corneal transplantation and donor corneal transplantation. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I was a Wilmer resident, which is when I conducted this research, so it's good to be back to where it all started. So, um, let's move. Sorry, it's still loading. So um, in 2013, about 20,000 full thickness uh, PKs were performed, and the second most common indication for a full thickness transplant was actually regrafting. So uh, this is a really common thing that's performed in practice today, and I wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about whether or not it's useful. Sorry, it's not. Okay. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> so, um, so regrafts, as everybody knows, has a much higher risk of failure than first-time grafts, and there's probably immune changes in the host, there's neovascularization, there's multiple reasons that this happens. And we know that each successive graft has a lower likelihood of success than the first graft. Um, even for diagnoses such as Fuchs or keratoconus, it's very common to have failure um, after the first one. And the other issue with PKs is that they, the visual recovery can take up to two years, and that's a long time. You're removing sutures, you're getting fitting with hard contact lenses, and you're sort of just waiting until uh, the cornea is optimized to uh, get that done. Um, so we're doing a lot of these. Um, and the question is, is it really useful? So the Boston uh, K-Pro might be a better alternative for these patients. Um, in 1992, it was initially FDA approved, and about 8,000 devices have been planted. Uh, the beauty of the K-Pro, as everybody knows, is the visual recovery is instant. So these patients will see the best potential vision that the retina can see usually on day one. Um, but unfortunately, as we've all been discussing tonight, um, the higher, there is a much higher complication profile, including retinal detachments, um, endophthalmitis, uh, glaucoma. Um, so we wanted to, ask, uh, to figure out which, is to, which uh, modality might be best for certain patients. Uh, when do you do a repeat PK or when do you just go for the k -Pro? Um But there's an, unfortunately no studies that directly compare the two. And so we decided to do a meta-analysis comparing these two outcomes. And so we uh, looked at four different databases and searched a basic set of criteria. And we looked at multiple different outcomes, but ended up going with these outcomes because these are the only ones that were reported in the particular studies. Um, our uh, partic our um, primary outcome was vision, and that was a 2200 vision at an endpoint or 2040 vision at two years. And our secondary outcomes uh, looked at graph clarity and retention rates, but also looked at complication profiles, which is, I think, the biggest question and the biggest concern that people have. And so um, for our PK analysis, we looked at 17,000 articles um, initially, uh, ended up with about 388 for a full text review, and basically identified 26 unique studies that will qualify for the meta-analysis in our PK group and met all of our inclusion criteria. Uh, we attempted to do the same thing for the KPRO analysis and uh, looked at um, 14 studies that eventually qualified, and 13 of them were a case series, but they didn't have uh, the particular outcomes we were looking at the particular uh, 
um, time points we were interested in. And there was a lot of variability in the reporting, and there was a lot of overlapping data amongst all of these studies. So we really couldn't use them and ended up looking at the one large multi-center report, which wasn't going to cut it for a meta-analysis. So instead, um, to compare our PK grouped cohort of multiple studies across the world over multiple time, um, over a long period of time, we decided to use data that we had access to. Um, and this was a multi-center uh, re uh, review of, of, of five surgeons at different hospitals across the country. And, and the beautiful thing about this is that we actually had access to all of the data from multiple time points. We actually had access to all the surgeons as well. And um, Within, the, within this cohort, we could compare basically all of our out, um, outcomes of interest at the various time put, points of interest. And in the end, we ended up including 104 patients with a wide range of pathology. I want to make sure that you guys uh, know that about a third of the patients in this uh, K-PRO analysis had ocular surface disease or infection, and the, um, about another third had Fuchs, Keratoconus, or PBK. So it was kind of a wide range of people with a wide range of pathology. And so here's what we found. Uh, K-PRO basically compared favorably to PK for almost all of our outcomes. For PK, the, um, the, the chance of achieving 2200 vision at two years was 42%, and with K-PRO, it was about 80%. Um, and you can actually see in this uh, PK group, there's actually a, quite a big range of distribution between different groups. And let's look a, take a little look at why that might be. Now those with a lower chance of attaining success at the star here, um, they had a longer follow-up times, a higher amount of patients with ocular surface disease or unknown diagnoses, whereas those with higher chances of success of meeting the 2200 endpoint um, came from places like Australia where a lot of the patients were referred for PBK or keratoconus um, as well. So the KPRO numbers that we do report here actually are comparable to other KPRO studies that have been uh, reported in the past, but although those specific studies didn't necessarily report patients with a history of graft failure in particular. Um, in our secondary outcome for graft, uh, clear graft versus retention, there was a 46% chance of having a, a clear PK at year five versus a 75% retention rate at year five for KPRO. Um, again, we have some outlying studies, and again, it has to do with what the indication was for the initial procedure. Um, for those that had a lower chance of success here, it was mostly due to ocular surface disease um, or poor quality tissue. Oftentimes, as Dr. Akpek had mentioned, third world um, developing countries uh, don't often um, have access to the same quality of tissue, which might have lower rates of success in melt and other problems overall. If, um, and then uh, in terms of our KPRO numbers, these are again corroborated by other studies as well. And then, of course, the question is glaucoma. What is the rate of getting glaucoma with PK versus KPRO? And I think a lot of uh, times we do counsel patients who are getting these full thickness transplants, but we forget. And um, interestingly, at year two, there was a 25% chance of getting a glaucoma in, in full thickness transplant versus a KPRO, which was 29%. Um, the two significant outlying studies here um, in the PK cohort define glaucoma as a very different thing. Um, the one that had a much lower uh, chance of getting glaucoma defined it as glaucoma resulting in graft failure, which might mean NLP vision, and those that defined it as um, just elevation in IOP might have um, a much higher rate of uh, glaucoma incidence. And then infection rate at four years for PK was 18% and those for KPRO was uh, 9%. And the outliers in our PK analysis included a study of patients with a high rate of infectious etiologies and actually might be comparable to our KPRO cohort in which uh, a third of our patients actually had OSD or infection as the in, uh, underlying cause for the uh, KPRO. So if you compare these studies um, or these two groups head to head, I mean, we found that KPRO basically compared favorable to, favorably to PK for almost all of our outcomes. And the thing is, graft failure is a real problem. It's a real risk, even years after the procedure. These are people you have to follow for decades, as you all know. Um, and so um, we have to remember that, and we have to sort of weigh that into consideration. Um, and the other thing is, the complication profile is actually kind of comparable, and I think a lot of people were surprised, uh, might be surprised at hearing that. The limitations um, is that this um, 
is not a true comparison. And the reason being is we don't actually have the same level of granularity in the studies for K-Pro. The studies are just not out there. It's such a new device. Um, and so it's hard to really truly compare them because we use our retrospective data versus pooled analysis from multiple uh, centers across the world. Um, there's also a huge uh, variability in the quality of data, as is with any meta-analysis. Some people will report outcomes without contact lens, uh, you hard contact lens over refraction, and other places will. And so there could be a center effect as well that could play um, a role in this, and that places um, might draw a certain kind of patient population um, versus another. And of course, whenever you're looking at survival curves, there's an inherent survival uh, bias, and that it might make K-Pro, the K-Pro group look a little bit better than it actually might be. Um, and so the other thing that actually we kind of touched upon a little bit today is that historically we've thought of um, having a K-Pro fail uh, means that it's game over for this eye, you can't do anything else for this patient, um, and it might imply permanent loss of vision, although obviously uh, that is being questioned by some of the people in this room. And so the question is, is it being underutilized? I mean, the rate of K-Pro versus PK was about, uh, PK versus K-Pro was 7 to 1, which is pretty low. And um, a lot of this might come from misconceptions about the design. Um, the an original backplate was non-fenestrated, and of course the fenestrated backplate has in, improved uh, the rates of tissue <coughs> melt, and the new titanium backplate might even have a more important role in the arm reduction of RPMs as well. And there's also improvement in intraoperative ma uh, management, which I think someone in the audience alluded to earlier. Uh, most surgeons now are putting uh, tube shunts in concurrently, which I think has made a tremendous difference in the rates of glaucoma. And we also have different devices now that are able to measure IOP postoperatively. Um, and of course, the reduction in rate um, in the rates of infection are also significantly improved because now we know what organisms live on this hardware and what medications we need to give these patients. And so because we as surgeons know what to treat these patients with, we um, are able to have uh, better outcomes for our own patients. So what's next? Basically, uh, both in, in modalities require a lot of close follow-up. Um, and also, the most important thing we actually do need, I think, is to head to head trial comparing the two outcomes for patients with graft failure. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Bob Morris here. Yes. Wonderful. It's good to hear from someone who consider us the dust cover for the retina. So, uh, Bob Morris from Retina Specialist of Alabama, Birmingham. He is going to talk to us about the retinal detachment prophylaxis in K-Pro eyes, so that we don't have to deal with that complication, if we recognize it. <clears throat> thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, I want to thank Dr. Klaus Dolman and Jean-Marie Perel for all the encouragement they've given me through the years. Uh, in two th I'm from the Helen Keller Foundation in Birmingham, Alabama, and in 2010, Dr. Dolman became a Helen Keller Laureate, and tomorrow night, uh, Garrett Mellis is going to become the 2017 Helen Keller Laureate. Jean-Marie and I go back too far to remember when we were both with Mockamer. Um, pardon me? I guess so. Huh? Yeah. So um, my interest in this uh, has been occasioned by the fact that my main research area has it been ocular me? It takes a while. To okay. Look. Has been ocular trauma. I'm chairman of the International Society for Ocular Trauma, and our group has been involved in about 250 temporary cradle prosthesis, uh, ocular reconstructions after ocular trauma. We ready? You just tell me when. Um, my co-authors are these individuals. David Rooney is in. Uh, uh, Detroit now as a resident. Don Parker is our K-Pro surgeon. Uh, Matthew Sapp, uh, Oltmans, and Ference Kuhn are my retina colleagues. And John Parker Jr. is a budding corneal doctor. We're from the Helen Keller Foundation, Parker Cornea, and retina specialists of Alabama and Birmingham, and Beaumont Health System in Royal Oak, and uh, Ference Kuhn in Belgrade, Serbia.
the institutions are there. You might need to help me go forward here to the next slide. I want to show a video if that's possible. That's it. But it's not critical. Let's just skip the video. Okay. An estimated 20% of operated eyes will suffer RRD within five to seven years of KPRO. Because most of them are involved with PVR, doesn't show up there nicely, uh, and because there's limited visualization, only 10 to 20% of these eyes ever regain 2200 or better vision. Prevention of RRD in high-risk KPRO eyes is thus of paramount importance and can only be applied at the time of KPRO installation. It can't be applied on the left, and it's almost impossible to apply it on the right. So somehow we've got to get it in there while the opening is there. If you notice on the left, we've plotted tears and holes that cause retinal detachment in 30 consecutive eyes, and almost all of these are at the equator or anterior. Um, and it must be stated at the outset, there really aren't any prospective multicenter randomized trials to guide us in retinal attachment prophylaxis even today. But what we all agree on is that you can focally treat symptomatic retinal tears, as you see on the right, and that is effective. The problem is that 90% of tears that cause detachment occur in normal appearing retina. So this eye had a focal treatment of a tear and developed another tear later on, months later, in retinal detachment, even though there was a complete exam and the rest of the retina was normal. This frustrated retina doctors, and in the 70s and 80s, they began to do encircling laser treatment, as you see here. The problem was all they had was a three-mirror contact lens and a slit lamp, and they could only see uh, small areas of the periphery at a time, and it was difficult to get laser treatment all the way to the aura serrata. Uh, so tears occurred anterior to this laser encircling fence. Uh, and then if there's just one skip area, the fluid came posteriorly and caused other tears where there was laser. Another video I'm going to skip. A specific form of encircling laser prophylaxis to the peripheral retina, we call it aura secundus or clot or OSC, is a highly effective form of RD prophylaxis. We call it aura secunda because you're literally creating a second aura posterior to the at-risk peripheral retina. Um, so there's no untreated area anteriorly like there was in the 70s and 80s. So the, the take-home point here is that all forms of encircling laser treatment are not the same. And we've been using this technique since the early to mid-1990s, and it's been enabled by the fact that we no longer have to use a three-mirror contact lens at the slit lamp. We can deliver laser with the indirect ophthalmoscope and see wide angles, uh, dynamic spheral depression, and good depth perception, and easily get laser treatment all the way to the oral. So we're literally taking all the at-risk area for 95% of tears off the table. Now, as I mentioned on the left, uh, I was very familiar with temporary keratoprosthesis, uh, vitrectomy for ocular trauma, and we had a man who uh, went into retinal detachment after a successful KPRO at 14 months because of a sneezing fit, and his retina detached, went into PVR, as I went into tysis. So he said, how can we keep this second eye from doing the same thing? And that's about putting the temporary keratoprosthesis prosthesis on, performing the vitrectomy, and performing the encircling laser. And about almost six years later now, he's uh, perfectly stable in the second eye. So combined TKP, KPRO vitrectomy also removes vitreous hemorrhage that's occasioned by the uh, uh, corneal incision, removes vitreous opacities, reduces future vitreous traction from PVD events, prepares the eye for possible pars planus shunt, improves topical drug access to the vitreous cavity, and allows a last chance inspection of the entire retina. I mean last chance through an, through an unrestricted aperture, 
uh, as Dr. Oldman and his colleagues have shown, the Optos camera allows us to get out peripherally. But I'm talking about a completely unrestricted view by the aperture. And this inspection is also the first chance in a long time. So many times we'll find epimacular membranes that might have been overlooked or would be overlooked if you didn't have this closed temporary keratoprosthesis procedure. So it's useful not only for retinal attachment prevention, but a myriad of other things. And uh, anyone who's interested, please contact me through the Helen Keller Foundation website and we'd love to discuss it with you and, and seek your support. Thank you. The next speaker is Dr. Joseph Chilino from Mass Idea. I'm going to talk about the cost linking of donor party and boss party type 1 clinical trial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're comparing the speed, but this is like changing your tires and at the Indy 500 to see how fast you can. That wasn't that bad. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk here today. It's a real pleasure um, to speak here about this project that we're working on and now a uh, multi-center study. So the idea here, uh, there's no financial disclosures to report. The idea here is keratolysis, melting of the cornea, remains a problem. The previous studies uh, we, we've heard presented today show that the number one reason for K-PRO failure is loss of the K-PRO. So the question is, can we strengthen the tissue and prevent these melts? The early studies with collagen cross-linking showed that cross-linking the cornea increased resistance of the cornea against enzymatic digestion. So the obvious idea here is, what if we were to cross-link the carrier tissue for the Boston K-PRO to prevent these melts? Well, unlike a patient with keratoconus, we have some options. We can cross-link the front of the cornea, we can cross-link the back of the cornea, or we can cross-link both. So we did a pilot study to figure out what was best. Here we cross-linked human corneas for different durations, looking at the anterior and the posterior cornea. We placed them in collagenase and then measured the time until degradation. It was a binary outcome. This is what we found. Basically, 30 minutes of cross-linking the front of the cornea conferred maximum resistance to degradation. And that just happens to be the Dresden protocol. So it was actually quite linear in it, um, that if you crossing for only seven and a half minutes or 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 30 minutes was ideal. There wasn't any advantage to cross-linking any longer and there wasn't any advantage to cross-linking the posterior cornea. So that was the, uh, that was our, so that, that was our finding was the Dresden protocol was ideal. But the question is, is there any synergy to using gamma rated corneas? Um, we've all had anecdotal experiences. I've had a patient who had a gamma-rated cornea for a K-PRO in a, an emergency situation and has done quite well. So my hope was that if we gamma-rated and crossing the cornea, then we'd have some sort of super tissue. So we tested that. We looked at tissue that was gamma-radiated, and looked at tissue that was gamma-radiated and then cross-linked. And what we found is basically the gamma-radiated tissue degraded in six hours or so, just the same as untreated tissue. Moreover, that tissue that was then gamma-rated and then cross-linked degraded the same amount of time. So the gamma radiation actually nullified the effect of the cross-linking. Um, when writing up the paper here, we, uh, <laughs> we, um, we, 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 we attempted to explain that. And it's actually a common finding. It's something that's been known for ligaments and other tissues. The gamma radiation actually decreases the, uh, the strength of the tissue. And in my own experience with, uh, with PLGA, that when you gamma radiate PLGA, you actually decrease the molecular weight of PLGA. So that's a, I guess, an understanding finding. And this is not necessarily surprising. Is not surprising, despite our anecdotal reports. So 
what about human studies? Well, there's been a couple case series. Uh, we did our N of 1 case series and published it. And basically, we had a, a patient who had a severe corneal melt that resulted in extrusion of the K-Pro. We implanted a K-Pro with a cross-linked cornea. And one year, in the cornea of this uh, paper, and now it's been over three years, the K-Pro hasn't melted a bit. So that's an N of 1. But Dr. Kanellopoulos really has much more experience with this. He reported his series of 11 patients with the longest of seven and a half years. And he found that none of those patients develop melts in the donor tissue. What's very interesting is one of the patients developed a melt in the host tissue, which I think is quite interesting. It makes me think that if the tissue may not have been cross-linked, probably would have melted first within the donor tissue. So what, what do we need? Well, we need a prospective randomized multicenter, double mass, vehicle controlled clinical trial. And that's what we're doing. Um, it's a very clean study. We're very fortunate in that we have uh, funding by the Department of Defense. And uh, we have Carolink, formerly TBI, helping us with that here in Baltimore. Avedra was kind enough to give us a UV light for this purpose. And they're giving us all the riboflavin for this study. And so it's at TBI. The, the participating surgeons will simply ask for tissue. TBI has a randomization scheme. Our Carolink has a randomization scheme and they will either treat the tissue or not and send the tissue to the surgeon who will not know whether he's getting or she's getting cross-linked tissue or not. They'll uh, go through the normal follow-up and then at the end of the study we'll unmask and we'll find out what the results are. So it's a very clean study in that regard. We have 16 sites that are participating and we're just starting the recruitment now. If anyone is interested in the study, please let us know. The study coordinator, Lisa, is here. Lisa, where are you? There she is. Stand up, Lisa. L Lisa's here so everyone knows who she is. If anyone's interested in participating, please let us know. Uh, the primary endpoint is a time from surgery to device loss or replacement or other surgical intervention. And the other endpoints are, second, are the 12 month retention rate, the incidence of epithelial delayed wound healing, retroprosthetic membrane formation, and also we're looking at the cornea thickness by OCT. So despite the improvements in the K-Pro design over the years, corneal melting remains a problem. The hope is that cross-linking will help address this problem and decrease the rate of need for repeat K-Pros. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sian Dawson from the Tip Coley Cornea Institute. Um, Saadai Institute in Hyderabad, India. He's going to share with us information about the Arrow K Pro and update on outcomes and progress. Dr. Basu. Thank you. Retina colleagues in the audience? Any capable surgeons who work with retina colleagues who. That's my retina surgeon. Question is do you think that vitrectomy alone would be adequately protective to prevent tractional RDs? And I don't know if Dr. Morris was using the term RRD mm -hmm. to truly right. mean vectogenous retinal detachments as opposed to generically any retinal detachment. Because the sense we have is most of them are tractional. Would a vitrectomy alone be adequate, or do you think there's a role for the encircling laser? Well, you know, 
we do the track all the way, every single one of them. Okay. And, uh, it's a different, 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 it's a different thing. But also, uh, more and more now, uh, our glaucoma colleagues are suggesting that we do the same thing. It's so much easier to shunt it afterwards. You don't have to get the retina guy down to do the track. So we've been opting towards that even in the results. Well, the, the, Dr. Nakavala mentioned that in all the babies, he, he does pediatric grafts, he thinks the vitrectomy is indicated. The question is, in adults, does, do you think the vitrectomy alone, without applying retinopexy, would be adequate, adequately protected? Okay, thank you so much for uh, having me. So I'm going to talk about uh, the outcomes uh, of the OROK Pro. Uh, many of you may not have heard of it. So it's basically based on the Boston design, which uh, Professor Dolman uh, was very generous in sharing with uh, a company called Oralab, which is based in uh, Madurai in South India. So they manufacture uh, this K Pro, and we are basically end users. Uh, we do not have any financial interests uh, in the product itself. So it's available in India in uh, uh, two designs. The first is called the OROK Pro or the Type 1, and the second is called the LVP K Pro, which is basically a modified Type 1 design, which works like a Type 2 uh, Boston K Pro, but it's slightly different. It basically has a slightly longer optical stem so that you can cover the graft cornea, the donor cornea with a buccal mucous membrane or a labial mucous membrane graft. Otherwise the dimensions are, uh, the rest of the dimensions pretty much uh, similar except for the fact that the LVP K-Pro comes in a standard power whereas the Oro K-Pro just like the Boston K-Pro uh, you can customize it based on the actual length. The price of the K-Pro is much cheaper than uh, the Boston K-Pro that we buy from Assignia which is in itself a, a subsidized cost. Uh, it depends, varies from batch, you know, batch to batch, so you can get it from anywhere between $100 to about slightly less than $300. Now, uh, I'm going to share with you the results of the OROK Pro and the LVP K Pro. Uh, these numbers are pretty much similar, about uh, 55, and compare it with the Boston K Pro that we have been uh, using since 2009, uh, which we source directly from Massa Annual. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the MOKPs or the Lucias or the Boston Type 2 K-Pros in this analysis. So if you compare the outcomes of the Boston Type 1 K-Pro versus the Oro Type 1 K-Pro, uh, which is basically, these are very similar, are supposed to be very similar devices and therefore supposed to have uh, ideally similar outcomes. And the cases that we use them in, now in India, most of, uh, you know, the majority of the indication uh, is chemical burns. And uh, unlike the United States where the major indication is uh, failed graphs. But for us, mostly we use it for burns. And the remaining indications, I mean, in both the groups it was pretty similar. Uh, what we saw is that with the Boston Type 1 caper, if you look at one year, uh, the retention rate is above 80%, close to 85%, whereas it's about 10% lower in the auto caper. And if you keep looking at the survivals at every time point, so for example, at two years, it's uh, close to 80% in the Boston group and it's uh, about 65% in the Oro group and there is about a 10 to 15% difference in the survival rate which is statistically significant. Although the numbers uh, as you see in the uh, number at risk in the table below that with time because you have a smaller group in the Oro K Pro um, <coughs> therefore it becomes a little bit unreliable after a point in time about two years. But I think two years is a time point where it's uh, you can use that time point to reliably compare the outcomes of the Boston and the Oro and you can see that there's about a 15% difference in outcome in anatomical retention. Visual outcomes are pretty comparable um, and amongst complications we had retroprosthetic membranes in uh, close to 50% in both groups. Um, contact lens deposits were significantly higher in the Oro K Pro. The spontaneous extrusion rates were similar, uh, sterile melt without vitritis Again, the rates were very similar. However, sterile melt with vitritis, and this is a major problem with the oral device, that you have a lot of patients who come with melts and with vitritis, very difficult to treat, and you might have to eventually explant the capro. Uh, fortunately for us, um, we have been uh, very strict with the post-operative protocols. We have ha not had 
uh, too many infections. So the uh, incidence of both bacterial keratitis and fungal keratitis was very similar in our group and less than 10%. Uh, similarly, endophthalmitis was uh, again very similar between the two groups at about 10%. Uh, there is a problem with the orocapular assembly. It's not very predictable and we had this very unfortunate case where the locking rim came off uh, on the first post-operative day. This is with the early uh, you know, batch of orocapulars and now they have rectified the design so it doesn't really happen. But it's kind of scary to uh, have to look at this patient from the first post-operative day and then to intervene again. Now, glaucoma, about 50% of all our KPRO patients have glaucoma, but de novo glaucoma after KPRO implantation was about 25%, which was comparable in two groups. Mostly, we manage very aggressively with uh, topical medications, and uh, we've had to do glaucoma surgery in about 10%. So if we compare our outcomes just with the Boston type 1, uh, with the multicentric study, uh, we do not have 10-year outcomes yet because we started the KPRO program in 2009, uh, but our outcomes at five years are kind of comparable with the outcomes at 10 years and I think with more numbers these uh, uh, outcome results and the survival rate will improve. Uh, similar rates of RPM because we are more aggressive with the glaucoma management with topical therapy we don't really end up doing as many valves as over here and uh, our retinal detachment rate is also lower and I think this is probably because we try to salvage the posterior capsule and try to implant a zero power PMM lens as in as many cases as possible and our endophthalmitis rates again are very comparable. In LVP KPRO, which we use exclusively in dry SJS, Stevenson you know, syndrome eyes, uh, this technique, I mean the technique of implantation is very similar. The only thing is you have to do a buckle or a labial mucous membrane graft first and then you lift the flap of the mucous membrane graft, do the KPRO, put it back and then you expose the cylinder. So because the optical cylinder is a little taller, you can fit the mucus, you can tuck the edges of the mucous membrane under the optical, uh, in the front plate of the optical cylinder. Now, uh, this is uh, one of the cases, nine-year-old girl had SJS first presented to us in 2011 uh, when she had some vision in the right eye, but over a period of time, both of her ocular surfaces dermalized because of severe dry eye, and then we did a LVP KPRO in her left eye, which was done in 2013, and uh, she, you know, I recently saw her a couple of months before, and she still maintains 2020 and corrected N6 vision uh, in this eye. So these are the outcomes that we wish that every KPRO patient had. Uh, the LVP KPRO in our experience, because we have done a bunch of MO KPs as well, uh, the outcomes uh, are similar and the other thing that you, uh, the advantage that LVP KPRO gives you is that the cosmesis is much better than the uh, OKP because you get the pseudoproctosis because of the osteodonto lamina, uh, which sometimes cosmetically is not acceptable to patients. If you look at the anatomical retention, we have about 90% retention at one year and about more than 80% at two years. Uh, we do not have too much of a follow-up beyond that, you can see the numbers beyond that kind of can drop off because we only started this surgery in about 2010. But uh, if you compare this with the recent uh, survival rates that have uh, been reported in with the Boston type 2, and if you kind of uh, compare the curve at two years, if I, if I stretch my survival curve and try to fit it in, you'll find that at, at least two and a half years, we are kind of doing similar to the Boston type 2 and hope that we will continue to do as well or better. Visual outcomes as expected with the Boston device, they are very impressive. Uh, in complications, about again 50% of these patients have a retroprosthetic membrane. About a third have vitritis, which not always is difficult to treat. Our retina surgeons are pretty experienced now in taking a vitreous biopsy, ruling out infection, giving IOIB if necessary, or intraocular steroids. And about a third of these patients have glaucoma, which are mostly managed medically, but you can also do a glaucoma valve surgery in these patients if you want. Now, the orocapro, you know, probably has acceptable retention rates when you compare it with other options, but probably not satisfactory when you compare to the uh, standard Boston device that comes from, uh, you know, Mass Ineer. Uh, quality control with the Oro device is a major problem, and they have been improving on this, but I think I'm still not very happy with the devices that they give us. Sometimes assembly is a problem, and as a surgeon, you really want the device to be predictable when you're using them, uh, and you do not want patients to have unnecessary problems because of the device itself. So the assembly has improved, but it's still not very predictable. The LVP KPRO, on the other hand, has performed uh, better than expected. Uh, however, we are awaiting long-term results, and I hope that over longer periods of time they do, I mean, they keep doing as well as they're doing right now. The future, I think that uh, right now uh, we are, uh, hopefully we'll be able to shift to more affordable KPROs from Boston. 
uh, we have already started uh, with the human uh, with the exception of humanitarian use to use the Lucia uh, f instead of the OroK Pro and the Lux uh, instead of the LVVK Pro. So these are patients who've had the Lucia. This is how it looks cosmetically. It looks fantastic. I think the outcomes so far have been great. And this is the titanium sleeved uh, type two K Pro, which is called the Lux, which under a mucous membrane graft, you know, we have done quite a few cases now, and they're doing very well. So I hope that we'll be able to shift to better devices which are not as expensive and our patients can afford. So before I finish, I would like to acknowledge my uh, teachers, uh, particularly Dr. Sangwan, and also the support that we continue to receive from uh, Dr. Dolman and Dr. Chorosh from uh, Mass India. Thank you. So for those of you who know Victor Perez, this is not Victor Perez. For those of you who have never met Victor Perez, I introduce Victor Perez. So getting, he's going to tell us you're still getting a Puerto Rican, so. The Pan Cape Pro Initiative. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim. It's become a sort of a habit. We switch, you know. He shows up on one, I show up to the other one. All right, so what would the, uh, the Regardless of who you're, who's going to talk today, he's going to talk about the same topic that we both share, uh, uh, together with our colleagues from Latin America. Um, let me hear. And the topic I'm going to talk to you uh, today is giving you an update in regards to the uh, uh, Pan Capro Initiative, which is basically a uh, development of a database that it's regional. Uh, and it's unique in the sense that uh, in this region, we've identified uh, centers and colleagues that have had significant experience in keratoparesis, and therefore they had a significant amount of patients in their own clinics or in the centers, and also a significant amount of time in a follow-up. And, and therefore, we can basically look at, not just in the centers, but also in the region, the outcomes and have perhaps uh, move away some, some, I guess, uh, lack of knowledge or lack of management uh, and really get the, the real idea of uh, what's the performance of the current prosthesis, especially in an area like Latin America. Uh, this, I'm sure you've seen this slide uh, a thousand times. It's already uh, uh, outdated, of course, but uh, the continued growth of uh, current prosthesis is, uh, is actually growing faster internationally than it is uh, nationally. Um, and, and like I said, our goal was to then identify centers within Latin America with the help of the uh, uh, Pan Cornea Group uh, and their uh, constituencies uh, to identify the areas where CAPRO was done consistently over a period of time. And how do we do this? Because it's kind of hard to really uh, sort of contact all these surgeons in such a, a big region. So first thing we wanted to do, and again, it's sort of you can't see it very well, but we wanted to make a database that, that was easy to, to populate and also, also easy to uh, extract information from. So we tried as best we could to really assign numbers to every uh, uh, basically cell that we have here, so then the analysis would be much, much easier. Uh, and also, like I guess that since it's a big region, we wanted to then divide it in, uh, in, in segments and regions in which, uh, as you see here, region one was identified as Brazil, region two, Argentina, three, Chile and Ecuador, region four, Colombia, Venezuela, and then region five, Central American Caribbean, region six, Mexico. And then for those regions, we assigned uh, a particular colleagues that had uh, uh, either uh, a, a personal connection or already had worked in that area. So we can basically work on getting that data and getting it as sharp as we could in, in, a, in an efficient way. And you see all, all the colleagues that were involved in the, in, in the, in the I would say, regional managers, put it this way, to, uh, to extract this data. And these are the surgeons that were involved in the, in the initial effort. Uh, and most of them, some of you here, so congratulations to you and uh, thank you very much because this is continuing work because every five years we'll continue to re reassess and get more information. So it's it really retrospective, but moving forward, we can work it uh, uh, in both ways. So number of capers, uh, countries, Argentina 31, Brazil 72, Chile 23, Colombia 53, Dominican Republic 24, Mexico 24, so a total of 227 eyes uh, that were included in this study. Now, as we then analyze the data, uh, more specifically, and I'll show you a little tidbit of the, uh, the, the more newer uh, database uh, data information. We then narrow it down to perhaps PMA only analysis and titanium only analysis and so on, because the numbers allow us to do that and get uh, more specific information. 
So analysis of, of total eyes, you see the age was 56 in average, male and female, as you see here. Um, and the diagnosis, we, this doesn't show you here, but as you might, some of you remember, as we met uh, and with the Cape Study uh, Group again in Barcelona, we actually came up with some, some standards or some, some suggestions in how to report the data and also how to report it in regards to what is considered uh, short term, medium term, and so on. And that's something we'll incorporate in the actual presentation or the actual uh, 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 publication that's got, uh, being uh, reviewed right now. So, to rather than ask the very probability of these cases, you see here over a period of uh, over 10 years, which is also something that uh, we like to see. We like to see data over time. And uh, basically, autoimmune deficiencies were the ones that perhaps uh, suffered the most initially, and the ones that are perhaps stable and, and, and kept stable the non-inflammatory ones over time in regards to melt spine diagnosis. Uh, complications that we see here, actually the infection component there is actually pretty low or at the same, uh, same rate as uh, most studies already, 5% uh, infections in this group of uh, the whole region. Uh, melting, 34% uh, melted, uh, sorry, 34 being 50, almost 15% of the cases had melts, and then RPMs at 20% rate with exclusion at 6.17%, uh, which is pretty good numbers. And again, that's, this allows us to then look at the data and, and, and be confident that the people that are, are, are implanting these capos are well trained, are experienced, have experience over time also, so that also reflects in the, uh, in the numbers that we get. Uh, and then we looked at this also, I said, uh, the uh, Kipro melts by number of previous graphs, and uh, it's pretty much stable then, and, and when you reach then of over a period of five or six years, then when, that's when things start to happen. Um, before I go on to the next data, I wanted to show you something real quick, because I also, I thought it was very interesting. This is now, and I, again, I couldn't even, let me see if I can drag it over to that side. Is that what it is? Let's see. Oh, here it is. So what I wanted to show you here, this is actually only looking at PMMA. So the numbers are different. They went down to, I think it was 120 or so, I can't remember. But basically, you look at, this is where we say, you know, don't, don't uh, rest on your rolls because you had a very good outcome the first year. Because it's going to happen, it's going to happen in your first year. And you see it here, RPMs, this is patients that develop RPMs. And uh, the ones that develop RPMs, um, in a year or so, it was 63%. So it's gonna, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen pretty early on. It doesn't mean that later on it won't happen. For most of the time, RPMs will happen early on. And then you see it, depending on the uh, preoperative diagnosis, you see the numbers over there. And then, see, where's my mouse? There we go. And I apologize, because since Victor, you know, sort of told me like in five minutes ago that I need to present, that, that's why I couldn't incorporate it in the presentation. But, and then here you see melting incidence by preoperative diagnosis, you see then, okay, by time of follow-up, within a year or less, 44% of the patients then by diagnosis you see there, they have the rates of, uh, of melting. And as it goes down, and you probably can rest a little bit better that, that you pass that year, you're still gonna have issues, but perhaps you know, you sort of weathered a little bit of the storm. But again, always the first year is a critical year, and uh, if you pass the first year, you're pretty much assured that you know, you're gonna have a not easier time, but at least not as a you know, stressful time as that. Uh, as uh, uh, in other situations. Anyway, going back to the presentation here, if I can find my mouse here. Oh, here. I'm almost at the end. So again, we saw this already. And then uh, a final vision by previous graphs, and you see how over a period of time, again, the period around between two to three to five years is when things start deteriorating uh, in cases like in, the, in Capro in this region. Capro mills by back plate size, again, not much difference. You pretty much follow the same, the same rate, more or less. And it's what's good to see, it's always over a significant amount of years. So in conclusion, Latin American Caribbean Capro database was successfully done. Permuted data results demonstrate similar outcome patterns to previous published reports, and we have a unique set of variables that can be analyzed and have significant contribution to the Kipper community. And what's, again, as we started doing this, uh, we also now are trying to encourage other groups, other regions, to actually, instead of having to present or present their own data, put the data together within a region so we can have a much better way, greater numbers, and uh, I guess a truer uh, a, a vision of what to expect and uh, different complications and how to avoid them uh, uh, with the uh, database as a group. Um, 
with that, I, I thank you for your time. And uh, my name is not Victor Perez. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. We have stayed remarkably on time, <laughs> so uh, we're gonna let. We're not gonna let uh, anything uh, mess that up. Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. So don't worry. Don't worry. You're doing great. <laughs> Take a question from the audience or any of the previous speakers. Yes, Samaya. Is there a difference in what the indications are for like compared to countries? Like it's interesting that India has so many ways different than in Latin America, whether it's you know there wasn't and I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the Could you repeat the question please? She was asking if there's any uh different differences in indications for paper oil in Latin America. Like you mentioned in India they have Worms. Uh, I would say that there was one particular diagnosis that was, you know, outstanding uh, compared to the other, which is pretty much even uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the region. So pretty much. So the yeah, I could say that one was uh, basically stood out from the other. Because Jose, in that in within Latin America, though, there are certain countries that have high incidence of chemical burns and others that have low, right? right? Very correct. But they didn't show, I mean, it didn't show, you didn't show, but yes, you're right. Thank you. One more time, thank you for having me here. Um, today I'm going to talk about the P3 Capro study, the true story about the naive Capro. We know that uh, Capro has been under constant changes and improvements since its approval by the FDA in 1992. And we have different, uh, multiple published data that have shown that it's a viable option for visual rehabilitation in patients after multiple graft failure. But what do we know and what should we do with patients with severe limbal stem cell deficiency or severe corneal neovascularization, herpetic or neurotrophic keratitis, that we know that these patients have poor prognosis for a parenteric keratoplasty? Or patients that are in need in a need of fast visual rehabilitation, for example, elderly patients. Is a primary keratoprosthesis a good option for these patients? We know that there are several complications after keratoprosthesis implantation, for example, retroprostective membrane, glaucoma, infections, retinal detachment, melting, extrusion. But do we really know if these complications are completely related to the keratoprosthesis implantation or are any other um, factors, for example, the multiple previous procedures that these eyes had before going to keratoprosthesis? Can uh, et al. in their study, uh, they analyzed the anterior segment after keratoprosthesis implantation and they studied the difference between um, anterior chamber angle and the uh, existence of peripheral and proximal iris and And they divided, uh, doing the, um, dividing, uh, paying attention if the patient has primary keratoprosthesis or a secondary keratoprosthesis. And they found a statistical significant difference between these two groups. Also, if we're talking about visual rehabilitation, I think Dr. Ammon already took this point, uh, but Chan et al. in their study about primary keratoprosthesis in non autoimmune patients, they reported a major improvement in visual acuity around 2200 or better uh, that was maintained in, for the first year, but they achieved it as fast as the first month post op. In the other hand, uh, Tyler et al. in their study about uh, a penetrated keratoprosthesis in ARD patient reported the, a very similar visual acuity, but this visual acuity was achieved at some point of the follow-up, and the maximum improvement time was at least 12 months. So we can see the difference between the visual uh, rehabilitation in those two groups. There are only a few papers published uh, talking about prim uh, primary keratoprosthesis outcomes only, but all, most of these patients have very promising results. And this is why we decided, and uh, using the experience that we had after Pancapro, to design the P3 Capro study, I study as a keratoprosthesis as a primary penetrating procedure. 
We designed this study as a multi-center study in which the participants are established keratoprosthesis centers with at least five years of experience and all the surgeons must be formally trained in Cape, in Cape Rock. And the focus of this study is to see the, how the patients with keratoprosthesis and first penetrative procedure uh, do. And of course, we're gonna evaluate the outcomes of these patients. The inclusion criteria for this uh, study are eyes with poor prognosis for PK survival or eyes that are in need for fast visual rehabilitation. Patient with history with uncomplicated cataract surgery, eyelid surgery, torigen surgery, or lamina corneal transplant can be included in this study. The most important inc inclusion criteria is that eyes uh, that are gonna be included must be eyes with an anterior segment that hasn't been altered by a previous uh, surgery. Exclusion criteria are eyes with previous full thickness uh, corneal transplant, previous keratoprosthesis implantation, glaucoma drainage device, or any other eye that had an alter or compromised anterior segment. The database is going to be organized using an Excel spreadsheet that is going to be sent to all the participant centers. And after they fill out with their data, they're going to send the de-identified information to our center at the UIC in the clinical trial department. And we're going to do the further analysis. Uh, the database has different, has different elements, and the first one is the prognosis. As Dr. De La Cruz already explained, we're going to use the suggested guidelines uh, that was uh, done for the multi, uh, multi, uh, corneal multi-society, and we divide it in three different categories, non-inflammatory, chemical injuries, and autoimmune disease. In the non-inflammatory category, among other pathologies, we have the aneurysm patient, and these patients have underlying pathologies that can influence the uh, visual acuity. So we decided or we will do a further analysis of this group. This is how the database is gonna look like. We're gonna try to use uh, a number coding to make it easy for our colleagues to record the data. We're gonna analyze uh, other characteristics like Kepro characteristic, Kepro type, uh, back plate, size, and material, the comorbidity of the patients previously to the uh, surgery, concomitant surgeries, for example, glaucoma drainage device, pars vitrectomy, and anterior vitrectomy. And also we're gonna record the postoperative treatment. Postoperative complications, for example, epithelial defects, uh, melting, retroprosthetic membrane, glaucoma, infection, dolphomitis, and retinal complication are gonna be documented in the database, as we can see. Um, and we're gonna document not only the presence of the complications, but also the management and the outcome of these patients. Uh, specifically for the retroprosthetic membrane uh, complication, we're gonna use the di diagnosis not only by the slip gland, but also using the anterior segment OCT. The, uh, the final element of our database is gonna be the follow-up time. The first follow-up is gonna be the, uh, after the three months post-op, and after that we're gonna follow up every six months and we're gonna document best corrected visual acuity, optic nerve evaluation, intraocular pressure, and the medication that the patient is using. We already have several centers enrolled in our study in India, UK, Spain, Brazil, Colombia, United States, Mexico, and um, Canada. We hope to have more centers interesting and hopefully we're gonna, uh, many of you were gonna join our initiative. Thank you very much. I have a naive question. What does uh, P3 stand for? P3? Primary penetrating procedure. Keratoprosthesis as a primary penetrating procedure. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I have another naive question. Uh, what is a patient in need of fast visual rehabilitation? Can you specify that? Because that's an indication for primary or free. Yes. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, patients that had um, the elderly patients or patients that cannot absorb. Elderly patients or persons that cannot have the time to uh, wait for at least a 12 months of the follow-up that we need after a penetrating keratoprosthesis, the um, removal of the sutures and the weighting of the changes in the astigmatism um, is going to be this patient. An example is there, for example, one of the patients, and again, this is not prospective, this is not prospective, uh, a patient that perhaps I had that came with 75 years old, had a uh, chemical burn, and uh, you know the lifespan uh, is limited, and the person cannot put a contract. And some of it drops in, and so on. 
things that uh, say drops are things that will limit the amount of visual irritation in fake patients. So in those cases, perhaps they tra it goes straight to a critical process as opposed to going to a transplant. It will give these patients a quicker visual irritation rather than going through a, a, a regular transplant suture removal, either a contact insert or glasses to improve their vision. That's one example. Uh, another patient, for example, an that uh, you know has been already published in some cases that perhaps their their uh, their outcomes with a regular transplant are limited, and these patients will straighten their progress. Well, yeah, anorexia is is the main indication, especially aphidic anorexics do very well with plastic. Um, in fact, I have two patients who are able to drive. Um, they have um, cake in the one eye. Um, well, I, I was an advocate of primary cake in many, many different kinds of situations, especially the aniridia and hypotony and siliconol in the back of the eye. Ocular surface disease is one thing, though. It's um, Every single uh, large case series or multi-center series demonstrated that surface disease is a little bit different in that over short term, these patients get pretty good um, visual acuity with the K-PRO as compared to limbal stem cell deficiency and without the requirement of immunosuppression. But over long term, melts and uh, extrusions and infections are common. But with um, after the presentation, um, um, and, um, yes. <laughs> After my in your presentation, I think that maybe with immunosuppression, the capro might be actually a, a good idea in these patients, especially if they don't already have a history of multiple retinal detachments and, and terrible glaucoma damage and all that. They're likely to get pretty good outcomes from um, capro. So it's really a controversial topic. I mean, it's, uh, it's not something that we're advocating to say, you know, go ahead and do your first kid as a primary kid and go from there. But, uh, you know, also the ones that are here that uh, identified some patients that just say, you know what, it's, with the experience that I've gotten, the overall experience in all centers, there's some patients that uh, get a, a real benefit from going directly into a, 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 a kid as a, uh, a prime procedure versus undergoing uh, yeah. The the thing I want to stress is that we should never think about oh yeah let me try one more let me just try the PK first and let me try one more and then another one more really it's it's not something that's in the patient's best interest there are these patients we know them they're not going to do well I think it's better to just skip the penetrating keratoplasty and just do the K pro who are the best candidates. It's questionable, but there are those patients. I think we should not consider um, penetrating keratoplasty. I, I guess also one other thing is that, that, that we always discuss with Klaus is uh, sometimes we we, uh, we say this happened because of the caper, but a lot of things yeah. that we're doing have had three, four transplants that are already adverse to having complications. And one of the things I, I think uh, we want to look at having this greater amount of data of primary caper is, is the source of complications because of multiple procedures or because of the device being implanted. And this uh, study will help us understand that better because now we're going into a sort of a naive eye, in other words, you know, other than any gene tracker lens, we can very identify are they more prone or equally uh, prone to these complications that, as an eye that's had multiple procedures and a abnormal venture segment. Mm -hmm. I might have misunderstood, but TNF alpha, um, I think that your presentation was about TNF alpha being um, uh, um, expressed in multiple failed um, PK patients as well. I, I believe it because there are a lot of patients who go blind from glaucoma after multiple PKs. They have never had Capro. I think that some of the things definitely are related to Capro, but some of the things we can't blame. Capra alone. I think multiple surgeries is also a um, factor there. Is Dr. Mod still here? Yeah, so I had a question. There was one question about the study. It's an excellent paper. But the question was in the comparison of retention versus clarity. So that was the one thing in that paper that I struggled with. 
Uh, are they really com should they really be compared? No, no they, they don't have to be, but that's just one measure. But after that, multiple other yeah. things, yeah. yeah. We, we, I mean, how how can you? Yes. Like, you can't. So, yeah. I agree. <laughs> and you mentioned 80% infections in Kelvin class versus 5 to 15% of endophthalmitis. What type of infection are you really referring to if you talk about 80% of infections in mean to mean case? Yeah, the majority of those were infectious keratitis. Um, I don't think that most of them reported on rates of endophthalmitis, like in particular, not endophthalmitis, not endophthalmitis just infectious keratitis. We, we did have a, there was, if you, in the paper, there is an infectious keratitis cohort as well as the endophthalmitis. I just grouped it together and I put both for the purposes of this, of this talk. But if you look at the paper, I do compare it. I think the rates of infectious keratitis were still less than 20%. It was, um, I think it was like less than, it was less than 10% actually, from what I remember, for k The rate of endophthalmitis? Was 9%, I think. 9%? Yeah. It is too high. It, that's the thing. It's like you're, you can't really, and that's the, we need a, com, a real trial to compare the two. I'm waiting for your answer. <laughs> this is very important to us. So, so rather than answer your question, let me just free associate for, for a moment on the role of vitrectomy in K-PRO as I see it working with Dr. Uh, Akpak pretty closely on a large number of cases now over. This is Dr. Galwak, he's a retina. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, vitrectomy is pretty, uh, pretty useful when it comes to clearing the visual axis and creating space for, for your device, right? And it's probably very useful to have at least anterior vitrectomy and to free up those structures at the time of uh, device implantation so that you don't create peripheral traction on the retina and pull a tear there. Okay. But I don't think you necessarily need to have a complete vitrectomy for the purpose of placing a K-PRO. I don't think there's uh, going to be a, a benefit in terms of preventing retinal detachment by having uh, a complete vitrectomy. We know that uh, the number one cause of failure of retinal detachment surgery following vitrectomy is PVR, and that's the number one cause of detachment in the setting of K-PROS. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily logical that uh, it would cure that problem, especially when you're in the presence of inflammatory eye disease, prior trauma, uh, trauma from the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, hemorrhage and so forth at the time of implantation. In terms of uh, vitrectomy and laser, when the eye is open sky, for my money, I'd like you to get the eye closed because I think you're at less risk of superchoroidal hemorrhage and other complications which are equally devastating. But, but let's think this through a little bit more. If yeah. you have access to the vitreous cavity, let's say with an endoscope, yeah. uh, with a closed system, mm -hmm. Would you favor a vitrectomy with a circlage, three rows of laser? Probably not, right? Because you're always, once the K-PRO is on, then you, you have a closed system and you have access. And we're not struggling as much as you might think to see the periphery with a K-PRO on. I mean, there's a very good view through biome. There's a very good view with an endoscope. There's a very good view with uh, well, well-played ultrasonography. Right. Yeah, you, you really don't need it. You've, you've got adequate view. Now, you do play the retina game on a uh, scleral depressor a little bit more. And, you know, with the, with the eye a little bit soft, you can, you can bring the aura very close to the middle, so it's not really a problem. In terms of um, laser, uh, internal laser, the, inter the so-called internal buckling effect, I think you... You know, you, you, you don't have some of the complications that you might otherwise have, such as, you know, laser to the ciliary nerve. We're not dealing with accommodation or iris uh, paralysis or any of these things. They're off the table now, right? You don't have to worry about lens trauma. That's off the table now. But uh, vitrectomy alone will induce about a 1% rate of a retinal tear. And uh, so it's not clear to me that complete vitrectomy uh, prophylactic laser or prophylactic buckle to support the vitreous base 
are indicated in this setting. So, that being said, when Dr. Akbrick sends you a patient with a suspected RD, because of your excellent view through, with your biome and some spinal kind of depression, you're very comfortable just addressing it secondarily. I am. And that's what you're arguing. I'm not really, I'm, it's not really arguing, it, no, no, no. it's what we do. It's what you do. Yeah, and it's, uh, uh, you know, wh when you work with Dr. Akpek, you do what she tells you to do, right? <laughs> There's no arguing. It's been a problem for me for many years. Ago. So you understand. Yeah. Yeah. Can I conclude some state questions? Oh, yes, question from Dr. Rama from Rome. I have a question for all the Pedro experts. Uh, uh, since uh, regarding post-fertile infections, uh, it seems more and more important that uh, the uh, commensal flora is crucial to protect against pathogens. And we are facing upper surface, upper surface disorders that uh, have indication for the patient. Did anybody look at the commensal flora? And is really an indication of using antibiotics uh, and at that dosage, since they are destroying all the commensal flora? I know that uh, if you don't give them antibiotics, you have a higher risk of infection. But anybody look at the uh, commensal flora? Uh, is there any way to uh, promote uh, recovery of the commensal protective flora? Uh, Do you have probiotic? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Do you want to take that question, Dr. Dolman? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you want to take that question from Dr. Rama about prof prophylactic antibiotics and the destruction of the ocular surface flora? I pass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other question? Um, Jose? Uh, I, Esther, do wanna... I don't have a question. Close but, the um, no, no, I'm. I just, um, I just wanted to recognize a couple people. Obviously, first person is Dr. Dolman. I, I have some gifts. Sandra got you gifts also. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Excuse my, uh, my poor walking here, but thank you. thank you very much. Thank you for being second gift goes to the Rebecca Capella. John Marie. No. Yes. No, I see you don't have a, a tie. So <laughs> you Actually, need that gift. <laughs> yeah. Let's make sure we don't forget that. You want to do it for me? Can we do I think it? I need to see an ophthalmologist. Would you know anyone? It the seems one? that my vision doesn't... Everything is too small now. Um, sorry you're having that problem. <laughs> okay, I will be... Uh, the last speaker, I think. Just to give you a few words about what is the uh, KPO study group and why we are here. Um, it was established in 1990 by uh, Lacombe, Alfonso Lejeune, and yours truly when we found out that there was no coherence among people doing MOKP, OKP, or keratoprosthesis, regardless whether it was from Boston or from uh, UK or even Germany. Pintucci was on his own. Everybody was on his own. There was no coherence. So we decided to create a center. It took two years for me to find the address, and I sent letters by hand to people, 
and waited, and two years later, something came true. So the reason for us to exist is to foster clinical and basic research on keratoprosthesis, cinetic cornea, or artificial corneal <coughs> implant. You want to name it differently, it's going to be included. And our goal is to help you, the clinician, to better patient care. That's the prime directive of the clinic. And to foster development and, of course, improvement in keratoprosthesis. The other thing that's not written here is to help anyone on earth, in any country or in any city, who wants to actually try to teach the younger one about keratoprosthesis is for us to help you create a meeting. I have never refused helping anyone, nor have you, young man, talking to you. <laughs> we were discussing age differences. So this was the reason for it. And we have researchers, surgeons involved in that field, and we try to organize uh, conferences as often as we can. We have a listserv, which means Alex, who is here with us, can actually send a message to 6,447 uh, 6, members currently. Uh, all I have to do is send him an email saying, could you please post this? And poof. It, it's automatic. And we have uh, our own uh, website. It is not dependent on anyone. I am paying for it. So it's not dependent upon the University of Miami telling me, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. In which, and we have <coughs> a bibliography which is not updated, and some news and bylaws and cons uh, constitution. We had today the 13th meeting that has been uh, organized by the CAPO uh, study group. And I think this one was a really good one. I learned a lot. Thank you very much, young lady. <coughs> the first meeting was a very interesting meeting because it had all the top people in keratoprosthesis. They came from Germany, they came from the Netherlands, they came from Italy, from France. They came from Boston. As you can see, Professor Dorman was right here. Falcinelli was here, his son. Michael Rupert-Hall from UK. John Worth was here. Louis Girard, who was the, only, the first guy transplanting an eye. Actually, he was a cornea. You have uh, the French guys, Caldwell, Lacombe, a young Eddie Alfonso, a shepherd sang, and of course, this young man here. Do you know who he is? That's Jim Shadosh, doing his fellowship at Bascom Palmer. So all these guys were in that same room, and Dr. Norton uh, helped us. Oh, sorry. And I need, of course, people to help me because some of the names are missing there. I couldn't remember all of them. So we have photographs at every CAPO meeting. These are put on the website so everybody can get them. We had 105 participants on the 8th, 95th on the 9th CAPO meeting. Uh, you can see uh, Professor Dorman right there. We, we uh, had Joachim Barake, if I recall correctly. Kepro Symposium in La Giola, 75 participants. And uh, the Kepro on uh, IMO in Barcelona. We have, oops, sorry, Joachim Barake here. And Guillermo, Guillermo Amesqua. And the 10 Kepro meeting was held in Kyoto. 16 countries were represented, 118 participants. This is uh, last year's KPRO steering committee. Um, Michael is still honorary president, sorry. 
back. Uh, I was Secretary General. These are the honorary member, Dr. Klaus Dolman. And we noticed that uh, some of the people couldn't help us anymore because they retired, like Giancarlo Falcinelli and Günther Gardner. And Deborah became the vice chancellor of the university in Western uh, Sydney, couldn't really help us. So, and Srinivas uh, Rao never answered her email or um, offer to come to and help us. So everything was modified, and my health is gone down the tube. So I'm stepping down, and then when this young man coming up, Jose. So this is the new Secretary General. You will have headaches, but I'm going to still help <laughs> you until I total recall. And uh, we nominated several people, honorary member, so they can work if they want to, but they don't have to. And uh, Sayon Bazou is still here. Yes, please stand up. You have been nominated on the steering committee by Dr. Vierender, and I have not received a single, I emailed all the faculty, I have not received a single no. So congratulations. <laughs> and as you have taken care of the last four meetings, was it five? I could never have done it if it was not for this young man, who did almost everything and guided me. You know about ophthalmology better than I do, and you know about keratoprosthesis better than I do. So, well, thank you very much, uh, um, Jan Marie. It's a pleasure to continue the work that's been done in this Caper Study Group. I will not forget, of course, that uh, we've had also nominated and. Uh, uh, I guess unanimously approved uh, the two more honorary members, Natalie Afshari from La Jolla, and of course uh, my colleague and friend, Esten Akpek. And thank you very much for putting it together, and of course for <laughs> being nominated uh, as part of the uh, members. Uh, very briefly, it's, it's, I mean, we'll continue working together. You know, I've seen those initiatives that, that we have, and also we want to also encourage all of you that are involved in, in CAPRO to continue doing the hard work and, uh, and, and supporting the CAPRO study group as we'll support you in your endeavors of CAPRO and, and, and creativity and moving forward. Of course, to Klaus, always for your mentorship and uh, all of you that are here, thank you very much. and. Um, Again, Essen, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful meeting. Uh, I would like you to meet uh, Mariela Aguilar, up, who is becoming de facto the assistant of a professor. I'll be nice. <laughs> He's a nice guy. <laughs> and uh, Alex, please stand up. This is a young man I emailed on Sunday evening saying, you know, we really should send a list serve to all the members because, that's yes, that's Alex. And uh, on Sunday evening, uh, whoop, <laughs> he controls this from his own home, you know. I don't know how he does it. And I did it. Thank you very much, guys. Well, thank you. Let's get together for the, for the group picture. Yeah. So let's get ourselves together for the group picture. You do it over here. Don't be shy. Hey, where are you? Let's put the background on this thing here. Put the like Capro thing. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the one, the, the, the logo. Right. I think it's in the first the first year. AV person going to take it? Or? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Behind you or the guy on the, the camera? Otherwise, we'll take it on our own camera. Do you have a camera over there? No, I don't have a camera I don't have a camera Nice to see you. All well? Good. Yourself? You look well? 
our things in Sao Paulo. I miss it. I had such a good time down there. Yeah, it's really good. Cool. Oh, that's all we just mentioned. I've had him there. 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 to make sure they can see us, right? You're fine. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. You're fine. Oh. <laughs> Just if you can see the camera, you're good. before the surgery. Who's <laughs> 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 pretty tall. Thank you. 